Tigri. up everybody we are live on bass and beer radio and we want to welcome mr Giggity. matt heron thank you for joining us sir how are you doing tonight doing awesome man. doing awesome man thank you for having me on so we're super excited to have matt on the show tonight i know this is a big thank you to rob rob's done a great job bringing in some of these uh, absolutely fantastic guests to come in and join us but just a little bit about Matt's career is Matt's been doing this for quite a long time is one of the original kind of one of the legends of the sport when it comes to uh, the shallow water fishing pitching a jig things like that but we talked a little bit this before the before the show and Matt told us you can do a little bit of work with a drop shot too so we're going to get into all that but uh, it's another great episode of the show here we're really excited to have Matt on um, and uh, what we're going to try to do is once our viewers ask some questions here, as we get into that, we'll try to see if we can get into a few of theirs as well to uh, get some engagement with the followers. But, uh, but again, Matt, thanks a lot for joining us. We, we really, really appreciate it. Um, so I guess the first real question we have for you is um, what do you – so the schedule for the 2024 Elite Series is out. What's your opinion on that? Do you think – I mean, do you like the schedule? Is there anywhere that you wish you could have went that we that we're not going this year? You know, I you know I absolutely love uh, fishing when we fishing when we used to start, off, start off where it was cold. You know, you know, we've been, been several years there where we would start, we, we like start off at like a Cherokee or uh, some, of the, some of the Highland Reservoirs where you know, you know we get to do a lot of jerking and shallow water cranking flat and flat sides. And that's just kind of that's just kind of gone away schedule, from our schedule, but we are starting different this year. Starting in Texas, and, uh, and uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be a definitely a different learning curve. We're going to Florida, but we're going in April, and fishing will be totally different. So so it's gonna be a good it's gonna be a good schedule. It's kind of uh, uh, we got a couple. We got a, couple, got a Tennessee River, River Lake boat in there at Wheeler, and then we got uh, the, 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 the wild card at Smith Lake in, in June. It's gonna be like it's gonna be like uh, fishing the Northeast, Northeast River on Fourth uh, of July weekend. Yeah, <laughs> right. Like, so many, you know, Donzies and Mambos, and after about nine thirty, it'll probably be hard to stand up on the front deck. But it'll be interesting. Oh. Oh, he's never mind. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> Two screens is messing me up. My brain only can do one thing at one time. It's like no. <laughs> nope. I'm I'm focusing on the audio stuff. You ask the important questions. Oh, right you want now. me to ask a question? Ask I, a I, question, I, 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 brother. I got It's uh, all you. Your son, Josh. So you're really good friends with Andre Moore. You're responsible by Reaction Innovations, and your son is is pretty big time over there at Reaction Innovations. Is that correct? Uh, once upon a time, but that's that's news that I haven't let out. We, he and I, neither one are there anymore. No, oh, I didn't know that. Oh wow, interesting. Well, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't know that. First one, I ain't going into it, but gone. Okay, well, you're still with Dirty Jigs, though. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The dirty, the, dirty. The the yeah. the best jig. The best jig on the market, IMO. Yeah, I like the well. Hey, what's up, Brian? 
Matt, Matt has his own signature series, Jig, with Dirty Jigs. And uh, Can you tell us the little history behind that? Yeah, I can. You know, the, the original owner of Dirty Jigs is who I went to work with. His name's Kurt Dima. Now Brooks. Brooks bought it out. Kurt kind of stepped to the side. But Kurt and I kind of, when he came to me with the idea many, many moons ago, uh, we kind of hit it off and I got talking about head designs and why head design works here and why, you know, all the intricate details of, you know, uh, weed guard angles and bite of hooks and strength of hooks and make a long story short, I put about 25 years of on the water fishing into that signature series jig line. And we actually is, had I, a, a, a viewer ask a question about it, and he asked, uh, he said that, uh, asked you why you like the 5 8 weight so much. You know, I like the 5 8 weights because it's extremely versatile. I can either punch thick cover with it, uh, you know, like if you're fishing a log jam, this guy's stuff piled up in it. Or if I'm fishing deep, like bluff walls or fishing current, uh, I can get it down. And a lot of times in the summertime, everybody's thinking, you know, everybody throws a standard three eighths or a half ounce jig. And you take a normal weekend fisherman and you hand him a five eighths ounce jig and it's like handing him a block of concrete. He has no idea what to do with it. But there's a, there's a lot of times that there's a lot of times that I can cover so much water because of that weight. I mean, in the summertime, I'm after reaction bites, right? And, and as many as many pitches as I can make a day the more better off I am and I, and I can trigger bites with it. Just like deflecting a crankbait off of a limb or whatever, I can trigger bites with that 5 eighths, ricocheting it off a of cover and whatever, or get it to depth. So it's, it's just an extremely versatile tool. Uh, main, I mean, it's just what I grew up fishing. I mean, it was the weight where I actually got onto this deal, there was a jig company out of Missouri many, many, many moons ago name of the company was Alron, A-L-R-O-N. And the guy's name and owned it's Al Dunning, he passed away, but that jig that I'm fishing with today, it's got my name on it, is basically the exact same head with a whole lot of improvements as that head was. So really? that head is really not altered very much at all from the 1970s. But if you go back and look at all the old tapes, Denny Brower, when he was on his tear with the flipping stick in the in the seventies and eighties, you listen to every interview he, he was fishing an Alron jig. Yeah, Basil yeah. Bacon was fishing an Alron jig. Uh, Gary Klein took that jig back to the West Coast. Diggity. And if you ever heard of a black weapon jig or the jigs that they're using now, it was off of an Alron jig. So that head design, as far as in rock, brush, wood, docks. And even like water willow or some type standing up stalky vegetation, it's just a tremendous uh, head design. It goes in and out of cover. And what we've done with my signature series with the weed guard and getting the angle right, it uh, you very it won't hang up. And then we kind of included the, the 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 final trump card making it for what I call the, the very perfect jig was. Yamagatsu at, at one time made a limited run of hooks that Kirk got his hands on. And we had to decide whether we wanted to go into OEM in production with this jig with that hook. And what it is, it is a, it's called a no leg hook. It's a, basically it's a straight chain hook. You know how a jig hook made where it comes down and you got a little about an eighth inch leg that stands up with the eye. Well, the jig, the hook that's in my jig, basically the eye is dead on the end of the shank in its, in its turn. And what it, what it allows me to do is now I've got a jig that's the length of a four all with a bite of a five all. So I've got a smaller compact jig with an extremely sharp Gamagatsu hook uh, that's got stout. The only, the only problem I've seen with my jig is there's a lot of one-eyed fish swimming around because they bit it. And I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I ripped a lot of lips. A lot of wise <laughs> fish swimming around because they bit it. <laughs> Name my jig when I invent my own jig. I'm calling it the lip ripper. You catch one and he's got he's he's blinding one eye. 
No, you bet her signatures are <laughs> right. We we uh we we talked a lot before the show, but we we talked about your experiences on the uh, Chesapeake Bay. Of course, what we all fish, and I was wondering if you could share some of those stories that you told us about your experiences here on the Chesapeake. I know you said you actually really like fishing here. We had Denny Brower on, and Denny Brower said it's terrible here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think when Denny fished it, he probably fished it when there was a classic or something else. And in the Northeast River, you know, y'all know, it's, it's made a tremendous comeback. Oh, yeah. And there was a point in time, I think, you know, that there were several Bassmaster tournaments there. It was bad. Yes. But, yep. you know, it's like any any tidal fishery is fickle because they're, they're very cyclical as far as saltwater. Diggity. Fishery. The years that you have good vegetation and you don't have a lot of saltwater intrusion, uh, the bass are able to spawn, they're able to multiply, and you got very healthy fisheries. And you get a you get a hurricane comes up the east coast, or you get some kind of uh, like we were talking about a, a big high tide, a flood tide that holds and holds and holds and flushes that area with salt water. Uh, it's gonna kill a lot of fish, and it's just that's the beast. That's the the, the downfall to a vital fishery. So they're always going to be up and down depending on salt water and situations like that and vegetation. But the times that I fished it, I mean, God, it's got a ton of fish in it. They're quality fish. And it's just like, you know, it's the typical tidal fishery. Uh, they're very predictable on the right tides, and they're very hard to fish when the tide's wrong. And the guys that do really well, well, you know, we were talking earlier that they, they, they make hay when, when you got, you got about a three hour window every day to make hay to really catch them. And the guys that really excel at it are the guys that can scramble up a couple of fish when the tide ain't right. Right. And, you know, you can always catch some and there'll be some kind of little something you can do on the dead high tide or when it first turns or, you know, all that and the other, but figuring that stuff out is, is what makes guys uh, you know, do really well on tidal fisheries and understanding that you ain't you got little windows and you better not be caught somewhere you ain't supposed to be when that window happens. Right. So uh, one of my uh, one a good friend of mine, Cliff Sanders, is watching the show and he taught me a lot about fishing, especially when I was going through college and stuff like that. Um, I know you guys used to fish Kentucky Lake a lot, almost every year back in the day. Right. Whether it was FLW, Bassmaster Elite Series, everybody used to fish Kentucky. When's the last time you fished it, and what do you think the impact that the Asian carp has had? Is, is I mean, is that like coming back, or is it still really not there yet? You know, I know Mark Menendez pretty well, and he fishes it all the time. And he said the smallmouth population in Kentucky Lake right now is as good or better than it's ever been. Wow, that's awesome. That's the last conversation I had with him, and uh, it's full of, of three, you know, three or four pound fish now. The biggest thing that's changed on Kentucky Lake is they don't, they don't, the lake doesn't fish like it used to. You know, used to, those fish went out, you know, they, the only time they ever come shallow on Kentucky Lake was when they spawned. Right. And then they went right back out on the river ledges. Well, now, with the Asian carp, the, the bait population, from what he was trying to tell me, if, I'm underst if I understood right, the bait population isn't really out on those, those shell bars and typical places that everybody fish for them. So the fish are now, they're, they're staying shallow a lot more. Than they used to. And they're coming back. So That's my wife. We'll, we'll just have to see what happens. Hopefully, you know, there's a lot of grass Diggity. in the stream on the, on the Tennessee River. The gunners will slam full of it. Uh, I got a buddy of mine that fishes Pickwick all the time. And he said that there's more veggies, there's more hydrilla this fall in Pickwick than there's been in five to six years. And that's, that's normally when the hydrilla starts getting back down to Kentucky Lake at New Johnsonville and on down in there. So hopefully that some of that grass will take hold. And, and i really love to see it come back because, man, that was – you're talking about a turn. That, it, that thing's monstrous. You can take a 100-boat field and you'd never see nobody. So. Oh, yeah. Wow. That's not happening it's, on our river. No, I, I fished it twice. I fished it twice in the FLW College Series, and I think 2018 and 2019. And like, 
So the the one day I actually did catch them, I didn't. I wasn't on anything because I had a bad practice. But I just ran the boat south because we launched at the Jet A Marina or whatever way up yep. by the dam. And I said, I'm going to run the boat south until I burn a quarter tank of gas and pick the first creek. And that's what I called them. But, like, I still probably had 100 miles almost to go. I didn't even get the Paris wow. Landing. I'm, this lake is huge, man. Oh, like, no. if, you, if you didn't get the Paris Landing, you had another 120 miles. <laughs> yeah, right. You got more than you think, man. Right. I got a, I got a real yeah, I mean, quick. It's, it's a long way. It's, it's, it's 40. It's from Paris Landing to New Johnsonville 45 minutes. And it's another 45 minutes to pick a dam. Mm. Yeah. Oh, it's it's a monster, man. Yeah, it's huge, and that doesn't even include Lake Barkley, because Lake Barkley is is I mean not quite as big, but it's still huge. Probably, probably half as big. Uh, but uh, it, it runs forever. It's Cumberland River, and it's probably a seventy mile, seventy or eighty mile river run. So <laughs> it's just a lot of water. There. I'm doing that in my ten boat. That's for sure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I have to stop for gas like four times. <laughs> hey, uh. <laughs> Fall to Kentucky Lake, it's you know it's kind of like the Northeast. When you get down there around the Middle River, when the wind blows, you're gonna find out how bad you really want to go. Right. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, true. You look, go. see, he really he knows. knows. He, he really knows. knows. <laughs> you know about fishing right here. Like we, we go out there and drowned on those days. Like <laughs> I just wanted to mention real quick that one of our uh, listeners said that because uh, Susquehanna Fishing Tackles uh, Bass Fest is tomorrow. And he said he's going to be uh, going there tomorrow and definitely buying some of your jigs after hearing that story. Uh, well, thank you so much. Check them out. It, uh, they, man, they have a tremendous fishing show up there. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I go yeah. over here. They do too. a freaking great show. And they do a really good live stream, too. They really do. Uh, what's it called? Um, tackle something. What the hell is their live stream oh, it's called? A, uh, like a tackle point. Talk? Tackle Talk Live? No, it's not Tackle no, Talk No, Tackle live. Talk is that dude, Andrew. It's, yeah. Um, uh, the tackle shop or something like that yeah, they call it it's uh, it's it's a, it's a great show that they have going on not to uh you know they already have a lot more viewers than us not to like toot their own horn for now for now they got they got kvd there tomorrow but we got mad heron yeah, so screw who, kvd exactly who is that, that guy right 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 <laughs> that's what i was saying i was like that can't. so I want to get they into this. They call you by your name. They just call your initials. That's all you need to know. Yeah, right. right, right. <laughs> so, so we had a really, really awesome conversation before the show about forward facing, and I know everyone. Oh, great! Another sh talk about forward facing. I but, hate it. But oh. your your point that you made was really, really good, and and I'm not going to steal your thunder, but your point was what's next and uh I'll, I'll let you go a little bit more on it but you said some of these guys that just catch the hell out of these fish now they couldn't do it if it wasn't for that so i'll let you go well, well rob's got one thing and then one we'll let you second there's like five replies tackle shop tackle shop live is the name of our show all right okay. sorry make sure we plug them correctly you know i'll tell you what i told y'all before if i showed up as a, as a 39 year old been turned you know when i turned professional i was I was kind of, I was a well-known local stick, hammer around home, won lots and lots of money here, but I was a straight-up power fisherman, so I kind of had to evolve. I learned really quick, especially fishing the FLW Tour with 200 boats and unlimited practice, that uh, you, these lakes we would go to, they'd be really good about three days of practice, and you better learn how to fish with a finesse worm, because if you didn't, you wasn't going to catch one. Mm. I mean, the pressure would just get to them. See, he's... So, He's, he's speaking to the right crowd of power fishermen around here. Right, yeah. Uh, you, 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 ain't gonna pick, you ain't gonna find me picking up that drop shot or that wacky worm too often. I just can't force myself to do it. You, you, you go out there and try to fish about six days in a row out of, out of the, out of the uh, northeast, and after them fish, we'll put about 200 boats in there, and you'll learn how to pick up that drop shot or that wacky worm or you won't catch one. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's just the inherent, that's, that's what happens. But, you know, because of all the tournament experience that I've, I've had and go, having to go to different, you know, go to the Great Lakes and go to the deep clear like Table Rock or whatever, I mean, I had to become a very versatile angler. I had to. I've always prided myself in not being, I, I, I try to stay current. I, you know, a lot of people think they, they hear my name, and I just a flipper and a pitcher. Now, that, that lake we were just talking about, Kentucky Lake, I've had three top tens with, with wine in a big plug. You know, I've been up there on, on Ontario, catch fire out of a drop shot in a 50 foot of water. So I can do whatever I want to do. And the deal is, up until this point, 
all the, the innovations that we've had have basically been conventional sonar. Well, we've kind of crossed that line now to where it's, uh, it's gone past that. And my question is this, where's it going next? When, when, when are we going to have, uh, basically live scope aqua view? Don't think that somebody ain't sitting there somewhere in the engineering room trying to figure it out. What is happening? So, and, it, and at what point does technology become more dependent or, or more important than, than angler ability and intuition? And that's my only point. You know, I made some posts this summer, and I, I really, I tried to start a conversation. Everybody, you know, and God, do not start a conversation about four-faced sonar, because I'm surprised you're, your computer ain't smoking right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a question because you know it. Uh, it's a hot now, topic. I, mean, I just I'm trying Diggity. to figure it out. I'm trying to figure out what this is going to do to the longevity of the sport. And our it, at my level, I ain't you know I can't throw an A rig right. They within within a year of the A rig, it instantly got banned at my level. Right. Because right. exactly, anglers, it was doing two things. It was killing the tackle industry. Because if you wasn't selling a harness or a lead head or a swim bait, it was absolutely destroying tackle sales. That's all anybody wanted to buy. And we're getting to the point now where, Diggity. with this technology, we're going to kill tackle sales again. Because right now, what's going on in this industry, if it's not something to be thrown in front of a live scope, tackle sales overall, I don't know if y'all realize this, they're down. They're down bad. Really, I didn't well, know yeah, that. The, the, the didn't overall, know. even with all the internet sales and all that stuff, there's uh, uh, it's still a down. The live scope beats are all there. I feel sewer. like there's more anglers on the water than ever before, personally. Well, according to the state of Diggity. Alabama, because we I've been in a royal crap show with Alabama DNR, <laughs> and according to their numbers, what they're telling us, because our since COVID fishing on our home waters has really taken a hit. The, the overall catch rates are down. The far as number of angles, angle success is down. The the whole, a lot of these lakes around here are on a downturn. And they're saying what, the, what, what I was told in meetings, you know, I'm like, every time you go to a lake Monday to Sunday, the, the ramps are full. And, and there's got to be more people fishing. And they're saying, no, there are fewer people fishing, but they're fishing more. Mm. That the overall sales, license sales are down in Alabama, but the ones that are fishing are fishing more than they ever have. Because they're off so, of work and all that. Yeah, so I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. Without without being able to be privy to license sales, and they're basing what they're saying off of the straight-up license sales. They're saying that the license sales numbers are down to 1980 levels in Alabama. Wow. Wow. Mm. That is crazy. So, yeah, yeah, I don't what the real answer is, I don't know, but that's what, that's what DNR said. My, my whole thing with uh, forward-facing sonar is I just don't like to fish like that. Like, that's that's not what attracted me to bass fishing in the first place. Like, I like being out back in the river, throwing at laydowns in the swamps. Like, you know, Big like, like being, yeah. and then out in the right. middle of the river just casting. And it just doesn't attract me. Like, I just, I just don't, there's nothing about it that really draws me in. I do too, and I like to I like to pattern fish. I like I like to be able to use mapping and duplicate patterns, and no matter whether I'm fishing shallow or whatever, I you know I've always wanted a reason why they're that why why are they here? Where are they going? How do I keep up with them? How do, you know how do I duplicate it? And but I also don't want to be little that technology. So, you know what what is the answer? I mean, there, there's a my concern right now is. I don't want it to get. If we're hurting the fisheries with it, are we gonna are we gonna destroy it so bad that before anybody finally realizes, that, hey, this is this is bad, that that we kill them, or or I just want somebody with some serious knowledge to, to address this and say, hey, this this is either long term long term sustainable, or it's not. Right, agree. Because I can see where this could absolutely put a serious hurting on fisheries. I know it's it's devastating the crappie population. Yeah, that's that's been like yeah. known fact, like because they keep they they catch and, and keep them a lot. Right. Well, they're yeah. also they're also able to single out and keep the bigger crappie, the the, the bigger spawning crappie. Wow. 
Wow. So, you know, everybody's kind of got their take on it. Uh, so, I, I ain't got. I mean, I've got it on my boat. I'm using it. I'll tell you the plus sides that I have figured out because. I kind of got, I've had probably two of the worst years back to back that I've ever had in my career. And it was because I got caught trying to live in both worlds. I know that it is, it is a tournament winning deal with that technique when you're using that equipment. And I have tried to learn how to use it and make myself do it. I just don't like it. But what I have learned is it is a tremendous piece of equipment, just like 360 is as far as running grass edges or fishing brush piles or rock piles, you can you can absolutely scan quicker and locate, you know, offshore targets, structure, grass edges, holes in grass. It is it is it is really good at that without actually being able to see the fish. And it's you know with 360, I got to wait on it to go all the way around. It's going to show me the same picture, and it's going to give me a, a a better picture. But that light scope is real time. I mean, when I put it on it, it's there. So I'm trying to learn how to use all that. And basically my philosophy going into this year is I'm going to fish how I've always fished. If they want to go sit out there in the middle of the lake and throw a live scope minnow or a jerk bait, knock yourself out. I could care less right? because I'm not doing it no more. I'm yep. on a, I'm on a fish how I fish, when I fish, where I fish, and so be it. I'm on, am I going to use the technology? Yeah, because I think it can help me fish the way that I've always fished. Right. Uh, I'm just going to kind of incorporate it in and if I happen to see one swim in front of it, if he's fishing, if he's around to lay down, I'm going to flip, I'm going to catch him. Right, exactly. I, I went to a seminar that Greg De Palma gave like a year or so ago and it was uh, it was an electronic seminar for Humminbird and I, I asked a question, I said, would you rather have forward facing or 360? And he said, I'd take 360 any day over forward facing. I, I've been using 360 since it came out, and it is an absolute tremendous tool. And the only difference between 360 and live is everybody everybody says, well, you know, if you ban three, live, you got to ban 360. No, you don't. I agree. Because, I, I don't think you have to ban both. I completely no, agree with you. Because, because 360 is nothing but a sonar. It'll show you that there's fish over here, but you can't single out a fish and present a, a bait to that fish. Dig you cannot. I mean, there's nothing else like that. You can't throw a bait swimming over his head and literally watch that fish come get it and single out a particular fish. So it's a different technology. And, you know, the guys that are good at it, my hat's off to them. They ain't doing anything wrong. They're good at it. And they have figured it out. And they are hard to beat. Oh, yeah. Uh, what I think is tournament organizations, if they're worried about, you know, if they want to truly address the issue, then let's go back to the Chesapeake Bay. Let's go back to the Potomac River. Let's go back to a lot of these lakes that we quit going to because the way we've got our schedule right now, I am not a fan of it. Basically, you can be a very limited angler right now and you can compete on the Bassmaster Elite Series. It's no, no, um, um... Why? Because this year is the only year it's been different. We Historically, we go sight fish for two tournaments. We may have one or two tournaments where we'll actually go uh, shallow power fish. And then we go smallmouth fish. Boys, that's all we do. Right. We don't fish in the fall anymore. We don't go frog fish. We don't we don't we don't go wind the plug. We don't go throw a flat side. We don't throw we don't I mean I got so many tools in my arsenal that I could that and that's why for years and years and years I was in the top ten at points because our schedule dictated you had to do it all. And now these these guys that are coming in now, they don't have to do it all. Do you so, think that that has anything to do with and like this might be a loaded question, but do you think that has anything to do with the sponsorships and that, like, obviously, you know, these? I mean, it's it's easier it's easier for these for the younger generation, you know, to, to come in and do it because, you know, when I was coming in doing it, it was it was like a a fairy tale dream that you actually believed that you could make a living as a professional bass fisher. Well, now these kids coming out of college and out of high school, I mean, they're getting scholarships to go do it, and it's a known fact that if they apply themselves and learn what they're doing, they can make a living as a professional life. Right. So it's changed. It's, you know, sport sport always evolves, and, it, and it's never stopped. Uh, you can go back and look. I, I use Kevin, like, I'll tell you what I, I kind of, over the years that I've done this, you know, the, the first known crankbait guy that anybody ever knew of was Paul Elias. 
Paul, remember, he wanted to flash it. Leland and Regan. Mm-hmm. That, right. that was the deal, man. He was sticking so his they, rod, like, down in the water to get it deeper. Was that that one? Yeah. They didn't make those plugs back then that would get to that depth. And Paul figured out, you know, how to get a plug down there. Well, that, that kind of opened the door to a lot of things. And then you had uh, David Fritz come along, and he really made crank and flash. Well, yes, in that time, time frame, this young cat named Kevin Van Damme was coming along. Well, Kevin showed up fishing the Bassmaster Elite Series boys. And that was Ken Cook Jr. He was a spinnerbait slinging guru. Still is. He's, he's, he covers tons of water. But Kevin took t- the technology and, and, and applied it to what, what David Fritz was doing. And he took the cranking deal to a whole nother level. It, so it evolved and it's continued to evolve. But, it, but now the cranking deal, it's kind of gone away. Yeah, if we conditioned right. them to it, but whatever, you can go back and look like Danny, everything kind of cycles and evolves or whatever. The same premise of what we've always done is there, but it but things come and go and change, and the, the, that's what the sports do. And we need we need to earmark this conversation and not look back ten years from now and say, where did it go? You know what changed? Well, how did it evolve? Because it's going to, you know, the bait selection, bait colors. Uh, every time I think we've seen, you know, everything we're ever going to see, and it's kind of, you know, this is what we got. Oh no, <laughs> uh, no, there'll be there'll be some secret bait tomorrow that everybody will have to have, and all it is, the fish just haven't seen it, and it'll be the hot deal. It amazes yeah. me every single year uh, some of the innovation that we see just come out of iCast. It yeah. is it's it's unbelievable some of the stuff that they come up with. Uh, they piggyback on some of the ideas of others. Uh, there is some stuff that enrages me that comes out of iCast. We don't even have to get into You're that. You're always getting too mad about uh, stuff. I do like some JDM <laughs> stuff. I, on the record, I do like some JDM stuff. So there is some, some stuff that comes out where I'm just like, man. like. But uh, it it always <laughs> amazes me the the amount of uh, oh yeah. But the thing time that goes like, these baits. So, it's like copycat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, what he's yeah, saying. yeah. He's I'm, saying, around the I'm bush. saying there's a lot of copycats out there. Come on, say it. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah there's a lot Don't of copycats out there, man. There's just, just a ton of copycats out there. I can't stand it. I actually, uh, John Cruz <laughs> sh- shot me a message the other day on something I shot out about him with, uh, with the, missile the baits scat, over, the, the, over cover the cover scat. scat. I was like, that's some shit. I said, it, there's, it there's a different a history than what's <laughs> out there. Right. It is shit, but it's good shit. <laughs> kind, of, kind of like a chopper, like no, no. You know, they make this. It's like you haven't seen the cover scan. It's well, like I'm just saying, you know, that I, I got oh, the chopper and the whopper plopper. Chopper was a totally new idea. It could not be a dick chopper. <laughs> right, it yeah. definitely was a whopper <laughs> plopper. So, right, we got Dan on here, who I know is a uh, Berkeley Chopo fan. So I'm waiting to see him respond because. <laughs> he was like, they're cheaper than the Whopper Plopper. I mean, okay, like, so <laughs> like the Berkeley Choplo may put out a different sound it's definitely than a copycat. the Whopper Plopper. But it, anything like that, you can't tell me that's not a copycat. Nobody had that before. Well, I, 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 no, I, I know Matt said he's no longer with them, so I really want to bring this up. Actually, that's wrong. The Vixen. What? Everybody that's wrong. Has, that bait was, there was an idea. That bait was like a big pike bait before. What the vixen? It no, was the taken whopper. At the whopper plopper before oh. it was turned into a bass bait. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was. It was. Yeah. Gary Dahlberg one. Uh, was it Dahlberg? It was with River to Sea or wherever it was. Yes, sir. Yeah, River to Sea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's, I don't know. Everything kind of evolves off of something. It's kind of you know. Yes. If, if you if you remember when, well, this whole industry is that way. I mean, oh. Uh, God, Garmin comes with a brushless motor. Now everybody's got a brushless motor. Right. Mm-hmm. And you really don't have a choice because as technology evolves, you either get one or you die. Yeah. You can't, <laughs> you die. You can't, be le- you can't be left in the dust because here's the thing. Somebody might come out with a particular bait that <laughs> sticks, but if you come out with something that is similar with your brand on it, if somebody is dedicated to fishing your brand, they're going to buy your brand. What was the uh, like in a Matt, way? You know, Matt might remember right. this. I, I feel I feel personal to that. I'm a big. I like uh, 
I like Mega Bass a lot. I I love Mega Bass. I'm not saying it's the best on the market, but there are some things with Mega Bass that. But they've been I, they've been I, accused I, I of knocking some things out off on their self. Yeah, right. Well, uh, they all have. There was a. As you look what the, look at the invention or, or, or the, the the innovation that they put into a jerk bait. I mean, now, yeah. You know, once upon a time, and, and everybody, I guess you know that the the normal guy will walk into a. Uh, a tackle store, and he'll buy a fifty cent Boyd duck, Boyd duck at knockoff. It looks just like a mega bass. But, but it don't fish like it, though. No. No <laughs> I mean, yes, sir. It's not. It ain't. Yeah. I'm gonna buy anything Boyd duck can, ever you, made. <laughs> going to that for you. But you can not. put as many Vision One Tens out as you can. It is not going to fish like a Vision One Ten. It ain't. No. Uh. no. Mm-hmm. Now tungsten weights and the transfer system and that and that mega bass, it makes it unique. And unless somebody wants to spend that kind of money and do all that, they ain't gonna get close to it. They they can put it in a package and they can shine it up and they can tell you it's great and wonderful and it's just like a mega bass, but it's not. I, Matt, I, can I can I, I, can I ask buddy. you a question? Do you do you believe in throwing something that's different from the crowd? Sure. You know I'm I'm big about cup. And it, it, I'll tell you a little story. Now, I learned this lesson a long time ago. We were fishing the uh, Chapel Eye Basin in the FLW tournament. And I got into an area. There was like three or four well-named guys that were in it. Uh, you know, we were fishing canal systems. <coughs> Water was very off-colored or whatever. And uh, I was having trouble getting bites. So in my deductive reason, just trying to go through color or whatever, that, that crazy coon ass water down there, the way it looked, I put green pumpkin bait on in that dirt and I started getting eat up. I've done that before. Thinking, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, this is the deal, right? And if you ain't got this, you ain't gonna catch it. Well, at the end of the day, after two days of terms, I went by all these guys and one of them was Greg Hackney and another one was Andy Morgan. We're all kind of in this same area. We all did really well in the tournament, but. When it's all said and done, we were all throwing something different. <laughs> right. So my, my point is telling you this is, it is not what you're throwing. My famous saying is, I can catch one on a bubble gum, a bubble gum colored rock if I'm around. It's yeah. Different. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're do right. Not, I, I do not get caught up in bait. I, I, I am a zip code guy. It is location. Because if you're around fish, if you get something that's halfway what they want, they're going to bite it. But if you're not around them, I don't care what kind of secret bait you got. You're not going to catch one. Right. Right. So, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. You know, here, the, the biggest thing in floor most people is if you get, like in my boat, a Bill Lowen's boat, I know for sure, because we, we travel a lot together. <laughs> you and Bill. That's got to be, that's I'm telling you, you got to make them videos. Yeah, we got to hear gotta make about those videos, videos. Matt. Hit up. <laughs> <laughs> that is probably the most boring bait selection in a bass boat that you have ever seen. Couple jigs. Uh, well, it is, but you know, and there's some finesse stuff, and there's some power fishing stuff. But my point is, most of it's not weird color. It's black and blue where it's green pumpkin. See, the thing, the thing that we learned going around the country is, I don't have a big enough truck to haul all this stuff. Right. right. So I normally don't carry it, but four or five or six colors of plastic. I just don't. I, I, I'll, I'll keep a, a chartreuse dipping dye marker or an orange dipping dye marker to, to highlight something up, but it's it's basic because somewhere in those five or six colors that I got, if they're going to bite. Something's going to want it. Yeah. It's like what I told Denny Brower. told Denny Brower was like, I'll flip, I'll flip a lay down, flip all around. I'll try to drag it. If it don't get bit, then I'll throw a spinner bait, and then that's it. Then I'm, that's, and he was like, yeah, that's not a bad plan. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's my whole bait selection. Oh, I, I, <laughs> I, I agree. I'm glad you said that because I'm a big, like, so, yeah, I got live scope, but I have a tw- I have an older Ranger, 19-foot boot. I don't have all the, the latest and greatest. I, don't, I can't keep up with it. Yeah. Like, I fish it's simple. Short, fish real simple. Scope. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. But, bro, well, right. But, like, I fish so simple, man. Like, I think 80 bass boat at the ramp the other day, and I swear for God, he had eight, he, he had 
He had to have had thirty thousand dollars worth of electronics. On that yeah, but God. you know what? Is that not the guy that you're worried about the most in the tournament? You roll up to a local no, tournament. No, no, I'm worried about the John boat in the tournament when yeah, I roll up. It, it, it's it's like what he Matt already, said. He, he depending, knows, like, depending on where you're fishing, if they come to like some of the rivers we fish, I'm not worried about dude, live scope. I don't. The care, deepest man. part of like, our river is ten foot. So here's <laughs> the thing: if we pull up to the thirds, if uh, if we were to pull up to the gun, that's why pattern, I got the aluminum boat, and I'll like, be bringing home them W's. Yeah, how many boy, <laughs> On, let's get it. How many times in the gunpowder have you seen a guy with a brand new decked out Phoenix Ranger Bass Cat just win all the Took time? Your money uh, a there's bunch a few of, times. of them. Not often, though. No. Not often. No. No. Not when Tom Over and Nick Rogers Tom show over, up. Tom Over and Nick win an aluminum boat all the time. Aluminum right. freaking John boat. I don't even know what brand Tom's boat I think, is. But I think it don't me and Tom have matter. a similar boat. It's a 16 foot with a, uh, I think it's a 40 horsepower on the yeah, back. Beating all those uh, fully Dude, rigged Phoenixes. Smokes every bass boat out there on, on the on the river every time. The river's but like 10 the foot The gunpowder is built for a John boat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You can tear a glass boat out of pieces in there. They should oh, yeah. they, they should oh, bring yeah. that kind of fishing back. And then it oh, will balance I'm, out I'm this whole for I'm all for it. Yeah. See, here's uh, yeah. apparently, you know, unless we got fantastic cell phone service and you know, satellite technology and all this and other where we can have T V shows anymore, we've kind of took a lot of the great fisheries that we've always fished out of play. I and agree with you completely. We really have. I mean, oh. I mean turning these TV shows and all this stuff has really started limiting where we can have bass turns. Right. And it, it, we can't now. You got you got half our field that don't want to fish in the fall because they want to deer hunt. Fall and fishing then, is great though. You know you can't you can't go up against college football. You can't go up against the NFL. We're fighting for airtime. You see, nobody, I, nobody wants to watch that. You can't put it on on Sunday with the NFL play. You're dealing with people that aren't passionate to bass fishing at that point. If you, you're not going to make it as a professional level, if watching Tennessee uh, versus Alabama is your number one, I don't know. The Ravens priority. are looking good this year. I'm not Hold up, the Ravens are myself. looking good this year. I will say <laughs> they are looking. I'm not good. missing. I'm not. Alabama playing Tennessee. I'll probably be watching them all. <laughs> who was it though? Hold up though. Who was it? Was it John Cruz? Somebody shared a video a of them Cruz hooking up like a chip on his Somebody now. shared a video of them hooking up like an HD. My cable from their phone that was, uh, to one of the freaking low range units. That was units. Fletcher, Fletcher Shryock. Shry and they were freaking, fo- they had the football game on one of their 12 or 16 uh, inch units on the boat so, coming off their phone. And I was like, okay, I can spend some time so on the water on, of, a, on a Sunday our, like that. When you get my age, a 16 inch screen ain't, ain't even helping, dude. I could barely right. see yeah. that shit yeah. anyway. Rob so Rob like, I'm out 50, of luck. Rob needs a 50 <laughs> inch television hooked up to the yeah, front right. of his boat. Yeah, just to see maybe, is that a fish? <laughs> question what's go, what's gonna be the the uh the fallout when somebody runs over somebody and somebody gets really hurt because we got 16 to 20 inch screens stacked up four foot high on the front deck and you cannot see yeah somebody right. that's somebody, asking the real questions i like it uh, somebody yeah. is going to get hurt i eventually agree. i agree with you Oh, well, especially with, like, you know, a lot of these, these go-fast boats. So, like, I just said, I got a Ranger, but I have a Bullet that I'm working on as a project. Sure. The bow lift on that thing is, ri- fast, is ridiculous. So, I can only imagine having, you know, 32 inches of screen in front of me. I mean, you ain't seeing. <laughs> at, at 70 mile an hour, dude, you have very little reaction what if you had a What if you had a 12-inch screen come unmounted while you were flying <laughs> 70 miles an hour and just smash you right in your face? Like, yeah. I had that. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, he's experienced this. <laughs> I, I had that. I stuffed the wave at Champlain. I waited too long to come back. I was in the inland sea. I did not realize it got that rough when I had to come back to Plattsburgh. And uh, it didn't hit me in the face, but it hit me in the shoulder. <clears throat> and I'm sitting there, and, and, it, and it's bouncing on the coaxes, and my marshal's going, you got to stop. I said, no, I got to get the way in. <laughs> I said, you catch it when it comes by. <laughs> <laughs> That thing hit, broke, ripped the coaxes out, hit me in the shoulder. Damn. Did you lose it or did God you? Damn, dude, did I you, bet you you were freaking feeling that, Hoss. Did you lose it or did, you, did it just go no, off the boat? No, man. Who, who was it? Was someone in the lead? Somebody just got hit by a bird. Who was it? I can't remember <laughs> now. And they, yeah, was like, I, they were I've like planing that. out like 70 oh, yeah. miles per I, I hour. I saw that. Who was that it? Hurt. I, I, who was that? Yeah, I can't remember who it was. Got hit by a bird. Hold up, Google search. Yeah, hit him in like the eye. I can't remember who it was now. Who was that? 
So, so while we while we're looking this up, uh, one of the comments it was saying, you know, we should get back to the roots, sixty thousand dollar boats, and I'm a bass boat junkie. Like I look at boats like a lot of guys look at cars, and and I just like I look at the boats now, and it's so yeah, Brent Height, it's it was so, Brent Height, yeah, Brent Height, that's right, yeah. It's so expensive, and I'm like, God, these. How how do you even get? Hey, into what's a, up, Greg? Thanks for joining us. How brother. do you even get into a new boat right now? I mean, like, I'm not. It's I'm, it's crazy. Like it's crazy. In this know, economy, what? I'm not getting no new boat anytime. Like uh, you, you guys know me, I keep my boat like glued together. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. Hey, man, dude, that's called that's called the Joe Biden economy. It's okay. Right. Yeah, Joe Biden has not been good to to me. <laughs> Hey, what's up, Tommy? Thanks for joining us. We got a lot of comments. We do. We, we got a lot of people joining in that are, uh, people. That are oh, pumped wow. to be here. They're good. Uh, well, hold on. So what, I, I didn't hear your thought, if you had one, about like how expensive the boats are. I mean, we got boats 150 grand. Oh, my grand. goodness. 150 grand. Could you imagine one of them new icons? Oh, it's got the G-Juice injector. you got to have the this G-Juice one. The G-Juice injector. Yeah, is I, that I just, a true thing? It is. Yes, it is. it's real. It injects it into the live well? Yes. Really? Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Well, that's kind of cool, but still. That obviously but... makes it worth $10,000 more. <laughs> nah, I could squeeze a bottle of G-Juice in there. Or something <laughs> like <that. laughs> right. The G-Juice injector. <laughs> if I didn't already have a YouTube name, that would this be my new name. Geeks me out, dude. <laughs> the you know, fishing innovation. Hold on, hold on. You know the single biggest advancement that's altered the course of professional fishing more so than anything? Detailed mapping like it looks like. Yeah. Did right. you realize that map card, how much it sped up? Oh, yeah. My... Can you look? I'm old enough. I showed up to fish national tournaments with a folded up Cardo Craft paper map and a flasher. And I had the, the, the map between my legs, and half these lakes wasn't marked. And it was not, I mean, hell, it, it, it Okeechobee. You did good just to figure out where you found fish at, let alone where the boat ramp was you put in it. Right. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm, I'm that old too, like Matt. Like, I feel you. <laughs> we, I used to order. Yeah, Rob's older than dirt. I used to order from Bass Pro Shop catalog and have to ask my dad, could I like, like I would get the catalog, and then like ask my dad, can I use his credit card? What's that? There was no tackle that, warehouse. That was like Christmas when the catalog showed up. Right. right. Yeah. It was yeah. like, and I would like go through it and they'd be like, I'm on it. And you had to like call them and tell them the number, like it's part number, like whatever for like whatever lure you want. And then like, I actually had to ask my dad, like, Hey, can I use your credit card? Cause you gotta have like a credit. And then I had to like go to work with them and pay them back. That's how we got lures. Mm. Yeah. Look at us now. I could order something on Amazon right now and it'd be in my doorstep tomorrow. Right. It changed a lot. Right. Uh, Mm. Well, it's just the world we live in. I, mean, it's, mm-hmm. I had a, that's why I had yeah, a no, ne- ne- next week, box. Next week, the crankbaits I order are going to be delivered by drones. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I heard sure. there's like drone oh, fishing God. now. That's illegal. Have you seen this? Look it up in the state of Maryland. Drone fishing in Maryland is illegal. I don't know why. It's dumb, stupid, but it, there is a law about it. But there is drone fishing. It's there. They hook the bait up to it and they fly the drone like way out and drop the bait, like like surf fishing. Well, that's got to be a coastal deal. Yeah, yeah, oh, it's yeah. Like, oh, it's absolutely. Like saltwater yeah, thing. saltwater sharks, whatever you yeah. could catch out there on the coast. I don't know what you would use that for in bass. They're, they're flying it out like four hundred yards. You don't get a bite. I mean, you'll be reeling in half the day. <laughs> <laughs> it it it, uh, it it eliminates the need of uh, having airplanes now. Right. You remember? Yeah. Once upon a time, I had to get a, a top wing Cessna if I wanted to go see a place and fly. Yeah. And now I can look at Google Earth or I can, you know, get a drone and set it out and go fly and see what's, you know, you ever wonder what's in the back of this creek? We'll just get you a drone. Right. You know exactly what's back. The mass talk about Matt. that. I used to rent airplanes. Over yeah. the lake, and we have some we have some questions here in our comments that we, we would uh, we would like to ask you if you don't mind. Uh, Greg is asking in one of our com- uh, one of our questions here in the comments. Um, how does Matt like tidal water? How do you how do you in, how do you like fishing tidal water? I, you probably touched on this. I think Greg joined in a little late. He might have missed it. Um, um, I absolutely love tidal fishing because everything's dependent on current, and it's they're they're predictable. You know and 
you know that you got limited windows that they're going to feed, but yet you know that when that tide gets right, if there's any fish around, they're going to feed. So, I mean, that's, I love fishing tidal water. It, it's it's aggravating, but it's it's really rewarding when you figure out what's going on. Yeah. It takes a lot of time because, dude, that slack time period when you're, you're sitting there, you're fishing one, two hours of slack tide, it just seems like such a waste of time. Right. So one of the comments I really, really like on here, it's from a friend of mine, Dustin, who uh, I regret to say got me in the points in the in the club this year, so I get my second place plaque tomorrow, hey, not good, my first place plaque. Good for Hell you, yeah, Dustin. Boy. Yeah, right? Good job, Dustin. <laughs> but he actually, uh, and we, Rob and I kind of talked a little bit before the show, um, so he says he would just be a rider in the bigger circuits. I know you've you had some interesting comments about riders before. Like, do you have any really good memories of when you went fishing with a rider and maybe learned something from a rider or had to overcome adversity because your rider was catching them and maybe yeah. you weren't or something like that? Do you have any stories of really terrible riders that we would love to terrible hear Terrible co-angler stories. Terrible co-anglers. I've, I've only got one co-angler that, that, out of all the years that just lit me up and uh, really made me mad. And I don't, I don't think that he uh he was aware that he'd done it till after it was too late and it was over. But I had a we were fishing Lake Travis in Austin, Texas, and that place is horrible. I mean, it, and it was cold. It was hard to get a bite. Well, I had found a I was actually fishing a bluff and it had what what's called a slide. A big bunch of it that broke off and slid into the water. And there was one particular boulder down there. This thing was like getting clear and it's twenty something foot deep. But there was a group of fish on this boulder. And I kind of pull up in there, and I'm paralleling it where he could fish the bank going down through there. But when I get up there, you know, I throw up there in front of the boat, and I catch one, I throw up there, I catch one. I mean, I'm doing pretty well. Well, by the third one I catch, I go back there to put it in the box. And I'm literally, I'm, the bait goes over my head. His bait does, and he catches a 7-2. Mm. Oh. Mm. And when he done it, he was all proud of himself, and he told me, he says, man, he says, uh, if I catch me a limit to go with that one today, he says, I'm going to do great. And I'll never forget my exact words. I told him, brother, if you get another bite today, you will earn that bite. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't catching no more today. <laughs> I put his butt on the bank, and he wasn't no more. I done him in. So... He put, put him on the, the back of the boat. Well, imagine being a co-angler these days with for facing sonar. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Look, it's got to be a struggle. Yeah. A struggle. The one negative, but for the most part, I have some of the best friends that I've ever made in my life that are still my friends today were guys that were in the back of my boat. Yeah. Because, it's no, it, and I don't care how bad the, the guy is or how good the fisherman is, I've never been in the boat with ever, anybody other than that one cat from Austin that I didn't learn something from. Right. That, that I was telling somebody the other day, the biggest thing that I, I miss with our rules package, I agree with our rules package because nobody should affect the outcome of a tournament if you're going to call it a professional tournament. So there shouldn't be anybody in the back of my boat that's going to affect whether I catch them or I don't catch them. You know, I could I could be all around fish and not it absolutely couldn't catch me, but yet I draw the right co angler that figures it out and now I'm instantly on. And I beat everybody in the tournament that figured it out on their own. So that ain't right. Right. But but the part I miss the most is the friendships that I've made throughout the years. Because used to I could go pre fish, uh and I could get with people that had been there, done that. And I didn't realize it at the time until now. We've been like eight or nine years where we can't get any information once the schedule's announced and whatever. That you don't get to spend time with anybody. You know, and, and, and one thing, the one thing that you and I, we all got in common about this sport, no matter what. The one thing we all have in common is we love the companionship. We love the camaraderie. We yes. Love yeah, you know what? That's what I was I, you know, at I, Thursday nighters. I'm I'm not trying to cut anybody off, but man, that is why that is one of the Thursday reasons nighters. why Bass and Beer Radio uh, exists, in my opinion. Uh, I I fished a lot in Maryland, just locally, just for fun. I didn't even yeah. fish a lot of tournaments. It just wasn't. I do fish tournaments, but it just wasn't really my thing. But uh, 
I started this podcast and had all my friends come on here because I thought that the camaraderie at the boat ramp was such an important aspect of bass fishing that I wanted to br- make people closer. That we, was part of my number one reason for this for this show. And uh, we achieved that, and now we're starting to move on and have just really cool guys like you come on to talk to us and, well, and educate I, us. I, what I was going to say is we fished the Thursday nighters, and you know, it doesn't matter if you win or lose or whatever, but the no. hanging out in the parking lot... And it's just the best hanging part. out, seeing everybody, t- telling stories, talking about. People don't want to leave. I've been so late for work because of them damn Thursday nighters, and we stayed out <laughs> right. there like one o'clock in the morning. Hundred percent. Yeah. Hundred percent. Mosquitoes yeah. bit me all up. You and come back. I want to go home. You come you back know? to the ramp at eight o'clock at night, and you're still at the ramp at about twelve thirty right. in the morning, just and your, out. your wife is texting you, and you're like, "Oh shit!" Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, but they, I love it. Like, I look forward to that. Like, right. I, I would miss that so much if we didn't have that. You know? Every right. week. Well, of course, it's always better when you win. Yeah, I want to, you know, we had a we had a questionnaire from Bass this year. There's a group of guys that wanted to go back to a 28-day off limits and being able to fish with somebody or whatever. And, I, and I'm like, you know, as much as I, as, I, as I like that part of it, at a professional level, we can't do it. And it's that's the darndest thing. It's the hardest thing because there's some cats that just you know they don't want to do it the right way. But I just like it the way it is now. But man, to be dri- I'll be driving down the road, going to the next tournament, driving down the road, whatever, and phone rings. There's somebody. It's, it's a buddy of mine from Wisconsin, or it's a buddy of mine from New York, it's a buddy of mine from California, from all these years, and you just you kind of create a bond and, and a friendship, and it it never goes away. I mean, it's, it's no. friends for life, and it's and it's awesome. I still like to check on their day to day life, and you know, see how they're doing. And they're, you know, it's it's just that's the part about fishing that you can't replace. Yeah, and it's that's why we all do it. I mean, we all love this. We all got something in common. That's how I, that's that's how I met Even this if dude you're right here facing sonar guy, or if you're a shallow water guy, whatever. We still all love the same thing. That's, right. that's, that's how I met this dude right here. I so said we was fishing in the gunpowder. I floated past his boat and I was like, Riverboat Rob. I was like, I like your YouTube channel, bro. And I said like this, remember? I was now like, we're no, just, no, we're no. <laughs> <laughs> That's not really how it happened, but yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that's the same thing with you and I, too. Yeah, that's how I met yeah. you, actually. Absolutely. I had a YouTube channel, and then I like, kept bumping into like, people who like, right. recognized me. Short, man. you got you to gotta have a good time. you got to have friends. you got to have somebody to enjoy. Uh, yeah, at the end of the day, you can win every tournament in the world, and you got no friends. Yeah. It's, not, right. you know, it's not even worth it. What are you doing? Yeah, so, personally. So, here's a question. So, we, we're getting into this, it, like, the pro level versus the local guy where we're at level. So, like... As a as a professional angler, how many local tournaments do you get to to jump in, and what's the reaction like? Oh shit, Matt Heron showed up. Well, that's a that's a top <laughs> three spot. Oh damn. Yeah, because we got a couple locals who were like, shit. Yeah, right. a couple people show up. You're like, oh man. Right. Yeah. Well, I don't fish around home much anymore. I no. mean, I just the biggest thing you learn after you've been gone is on the road as much as you know for the first. Six or seven, eight years, I was still kind of current on what was going on around home, and I heard a lot of that. They used to fuss, didn't want me to come back. I mean, I was a pro, and I, I heard it. You know, God Almighty, I heard it. And I'd be, be fishing with my boys. You know, at the time, they were 16 and 12 or whatever. And they still get frustrated. But anymore, when I show up now, they just laugh and go, easy money. <laughs> I don't I don't fish around here much anymore. I just, you lose touch, and it's... uh. My boys, I'm not really allowed to, because they, but they, they, they buddy turn fish together around home, and uh, I'm not allowed to fish anything. <laughs> <laughs> <He's not laughs> I gotta respond you know, to Greg they one second. Not true, Greg. Yeah, but they, they go, uh, you know, Dad, this you, 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 this used to be yours, but you don't fish here anymore, so you just need to stay home. So. Wow. Great. That's kind of, I mean, that's kind of like a badge of honor, though. Look, like, let me tell you're you right good now. To fish here. Hold up, let like, me tell you right now. You're more than welcome to any of our Thursday night three for oh, series please. if you're down here. Oh please, you I need a more I need, than I need a partner. We go out on a ten boat, man. We will go places. We go to <laughs> places that we call hey, the forbidden. Boat, man. That's, all, that's all. When I was growing up, my dad, we had a 
a fish marine flat bottom, and I probably caught more bass out of that flat bottom boat than I ever have any yeah. boat in my life. I'm, I'm telling you, I, I'm getting ready I, to I sell my collection range and like, go back to fishing out of the 1994 low. I tell you what, I got like a collection of like 15 broken props and just like. That's a great picture. Yeah, yeah. Just, that's a great I go, picture. I go like where you. I, I scared myself a few times. Like, man, I probably shouldn't have even tried this. But hey, Greg, I gotta respond to Greg. That's not true, Greg. I didn't give up uh, a lot of juice. That's that. You know all that stuff. Everybody knows that stuff. I didn't until I started watching Shallow Water Shogun. But For real? Some of it, no. Some really? of it, no. Some of. Oh, okay, was, so that, like they're like. That's community holes, man. Come on. Dude, I was a brand new fisherman at the, the time. The whole though. hole is a community <laughs> hole now. But let's just be honest. Can you well, fish I, it better than the guy behind you? That's what it's about in our area I, right now. I haven't oh, yeah. gave up any juice yet. Wait till next year. Matt, how many oh, times geez. do you fish? Not, not so much like a local spot, but you see several other boats fishing on a spot that you want to be fishing on. Does that deter you from fishing on that spot, or do you have confidence enough in what you're doing to clean up behind those boats? Most of the time, I can kind of tell what they're doing. You know, if if they're if I think they're doing what they need to be doing, uh, then most of the time I will fish that area. But what I like to do is, if I know somebody's in an area, I'll kind of alter how I fish, where I fish, and I let it rest. You know, I, if I, especially if we're fishing in an area where we're all fishing and I can see where you're at, I'll, I'll let you go down and through an area or whatever, and I'll give it a few minutes to rest or sit, and then I, I can ease back through there and fish at a little bit different angles. I like, I'm, I'm a big angle, especially if we're fishing shallow cover. If I know you presented a bait a certain way, and I'll come back fish at a totally different angle. Or I, I'll just... And a lot of times, I'm going to be honest with you, uh, there aren't a lot of people who understand about stealth in a trolling motor in a boat. You know, a bull in a china shop is not going to catch a lot of fish. And that old fuck, you know, that old story about leaving the, the trolling motor on 80% or 100% and going down the bank 100 mile an hour with your hair on fire, that works pretty good when you're fishing out in the middle of nowhere. But when you're fishing in the gunpowder river and there's 50 boats in there, you almost need a push pole and a paddle to sneak up on. Right. So when you when you fish the Gunpowder River, did you did you like fish in the backs of the canals and where the skinny water is? Did you fish main river grass? If you could, if you remember, like what was your main piece of uh, structure? We're all getting back in there in those ponds and back in the creek. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's called the forbidden zone. (laughs) (laughs) The juice apparently that I gave up. July and it was hot. The fish were hunting. You know, they were trying to move back in that those fresh, in a little better water quality. And that's you know, so we were all kind of pushed back in the creek. That's the hey, only hey, area back there that has a deep spot to go back to where they can recede down into a water depth that has a different water temperature. In my opinion, other than you have the forbidden zone and you have the quarry. Yeah. And uh, the depth well, is what matters in those areas, in my opinion. It yeah. depends on how much grass we have that year, too. If grass have, makes a difference, gra- but a lot of grass, depth, is a, out. depth is a lot of difference. When I fished, it was all fishing wood structure. There wasn't any grass. Yeah. Wow. Last year was like that, and they, they stayed back. But uh, two years prior to that, we got all this matted grass from the train bridge all the way back to the entrances into those canals. It was like Tony won like five tournaments in that grass. Yeah, I, I got on a roll fishing the Thursday nighters. We, and I, I would go out of the canal and make a right, go about a hundred yards, and put the poles down and throw a frog as far as you could. And uh, I mean, it was unbelievable because it was matted eelgrass. I mean, he would you, all you, he had to do was bomb cast a frog and and work it a certain way. Like, I mean, it was like beating a, a bass drum. It was. And then you'd get them. You, know you had to I, work it so fast, but it was awesome. But, what, but this year there was not a lot of grass, and I didn't do as well. You know why? Because they they had uh, they were working on that Route 40 bridge, and they had the, well, the, yeah. the the fresh water coming into the river dammed up, and there wasn't as much current, and that grass just didn't it didn't yeah happen this year. I so, love fishing grass. I'd rather fish grass than hard structure yeah, any like fishing grass. any no, day. I like but, fishing wood. No, like, I like fishing the wood. I'm a grass mm-hmm. fisherman. Well, I, the, 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 the difference in wood and grass is you can find groups of fish in grass, and most time wood you know, you're finding more singles. Yeah, you're right. Picking, oh yeah, picking sure. out. Yeah, and but it, I like that. Anytime you're fishing a tournament, if a guy if if they get on them in the grass, you better be sacking them in the wood. Or your picks will get skinned. 
Right. right. I mean, uh, it just that the numbers just aren't in your favor. Right. Well, yeah. Yeah, but we, it's a three fish limit, so <laughs> you catch some big it ones is, off of that wood. Three fish, limit. <laughs> three fish in three hours, though. Yeah, three, three fish, fish in three, three hours. hours. You kind of you gotta you kind of have to be heading back in towards prime time though. Well, sometimes yeah. you get slack tied in those three hours too. So. Oh, right. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, y'all get y'all get three hours on a dead dead slack tide. You be praying you get a bite. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah, or right. the last the last Thursday nighter was a flood tide. Remember? Yeah, it was horrible. It was like three fish brought to the scales or something. I had crazy. a good one on them because me and you fished it together, yeah. and I yeah. lost that. But there if, was like no fish came to the scale. If and then we, you could, if you could fish that series three hours on Thursdays for a point series and possibly win two thousand dollars at the end of the series, would you do it? Is it worth it to you? Everyone's going to say yes to that. Of course. Tom Overs won more than that last year. Dude. Took all our money every week. I mean, two thousand dollars ain't nothing compared to winning a Bassmaster Classic well, or some no. shit like that. But for the local stuff, for a three-hour series, it's three hours after work on Thursdays, and we're going to fish you them fish anyway. Like, you fish right. like we're going to fish them anyways because we're bored. Right. Uh, Why would you not enter into right. that? So we kind of got into a little bit, but uh, a big thing on the gunpowder in, in July when you get that grass is is frogging. Like, do you have any specific frogs or techniques that you'd like to fish a frog that you think are are absolutely killer because for me like this year it was a toad the toad runner was a really big thing for me but usually i'm a popping frog guy like i'll throw that thing and just work it as hard as i can spro frog dude yeah you know normally if i'm fishing mad and stuff i i like bobby's perfect frog smack for it oh yeah I like i, li- I like freaking tom <laughs> i like the hooks in it a whole lot better than a spro uh, for that, but if I'm fishing open water and I'm walking a frog, like a, a Pro 60, that pointy nose, it walks really, really good. Mm-hmm. I get a lot of bites on the Spro popping frog, but that's the fish loosest Jesse had ever been made, as far as I'm concerned. The hooks ain't they're too little in it. That's what he said. He I said the same that. thing. Yeah, yep. but uh, the Bobby's perfect frog. I've, I've tried actions and rods. I've tried. I've tried not setting the hook. I've tried setting the hook. I've tried. All I can tell you is that thing. If you get a quality fish on, you better not try to boat flip. Because mm-hmm. the way that hooks are even even opening the hooks up and tweaking them and doing all kind of stuff, it's like you're sticking the fatty part of the roof of that mouth, and when you go fly him over, you'll or he'll either fall off on the floor of the boat, and you'll see where like two razor blades cut the roof of his mouth, where them hooks just cut him, but they didn't stick. Right. If you get a big fish that chokes that frog, the popping frog, it ain't good. If you get him out here in the lips, you're all right. But if he gets it way back in, it ain't good. We uh we fish a, we fish a, we fish a couple frogs around here from a uh, maker called Tailored Lures, and uh, he's got a light frog. It's a small bodied frog, but he he makes these he makes these frogs. Oh wow, that changed a lot. He mm-hmm. makes these frogs with a uh, big saltwater hook. I mean, they are hefty. You really have to let the fish eat this thing, and then you really have to set the hook to get these salt water. It's it's a big salt water, like thick. I don't. I can't even. It's like a six or a eight o, almost, and how thick the hook is on the on this frog. It's almost a beast hook. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's huge. Essentially, it's very big. It's good for snakeheads. Yeah, we got yeah. a lot of snakeheads around here. That's another. Did thing. Did you ever? When you were up here, do you did you catch any of those things? Oh yeah, I caught caught them there in the Potomac. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. all they are is a, a bow fin, a, a colored, uh, uh, ain't nothing but a bow fin. Same thing, you know, a grinnel. Now, did you, bowfin. when you caught any, did you, did you fly them up and cook them because they're actually delicious? Like bow fin are not that good to eat, but snakeheads no, are I'm, tremendous. I'm I've never eaten one of them. I gave them away the ones that I caught. They're phenomenal. yeah, that's what I do. I give mine away. They're so good. They are so good. But I will say they are the biggest pain in the ass to freaking get your oh, hooks yeah. out of and get your boat all slimed up. It's yeah. like catching a like a it's aggressive eel. Like what was that? You still supposed to kill them if you catch them? It um, you can release them. You can't. You can't transport them alive. Yeah, you're not so supposed you to transport them, but you can release it. them. Yeah. Yeah, I knew at the tournament we were there the last time I was there, you had to kill them. Couldn't release them. Oh, you, yeah, they'll let you release them, but uh, if you get caught with like one alive in your boat or back at the boat ramp, you can get in big trouble. So yeah. you can either throw it back or kill it. 
So I usually yeah. just kill them personally. Uh, uh, they, I kind of got the same, same philosophy on them. They stock all our lakes with landlocked, you know, rockfish, stripers. Mm -hmm. I despise them. They, yeah. They, they, they were never intended to be put in a freshwater fishery and landlocked. Right. Well, right. they eat so, everything, and they're apex. They're apex predators. They're apex predators. So you go in there and you put them in a in a in a landlocked impoundment. You, you totally change the predator to prey ratio, and the native fish like large mouth, small mouth, spotted bass, they suffer because of it. Right. So one of yeah. we we have a good comment on here, and I don't we haven't really touched on this yet, but we we kind of alluded to it earlier. Uh, but the comment is, um, you know, while you were on the elites, while you fish the elite series, um, and knowing that the the getting information laws are different now, um, have you like what's I guess what's I've hear I've heard different stories about yeah, there's some guys on the, on the series and and don't name names if you if you don't want to. I would prefer if you didn't, but uh, that definitely get information, and I'm sure that there's little things like that that go around. We kind of talked a little bit about it earlier, but. How, how important is that, you know, if you were coming to the Chesapeake to have a guy who is just an absolute hammer on the Chesapeake to be like, hey, man, like, I, you know, let's, let's go fishing. Um, you know, how often does that kind of thing happen at the, at the professional level within the rules, of course? It shouldn't be happening now at all. Right. Right. And with the outside of rules, it, it I was going to say, too. The, the way our rules are now is as soon as they announce our schedule, we're off limits. Right. And they did announce a schedule a few weeks ago. Yeah, you know, it's 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 kind of it's cool because like the elite series, the schedule is off limits. But like you said earlier, when when the FLW was around, like even when I fished the college series, there was no the official practice was like two days before. But you just had hours where you could be on the water. I think the it's guys, off limits for practice. The guys on the opens can get information if I'm correct. Right. Yeah, that's, that's what I was gonna say. What I was gonna say. That's really retarded. Then mm -hmm. <laughs> it is. Feel like if you're going to qualify for the elite series, why are you not fishing under the same rules package, same format that you're going to come qualify? Right. right. I mean, they're letting these guys hire guides, they're letting them have people in their boats, or get them get information all the way up till whenever. I mean, it's retarded. Yeah. So why do you go? Why do you, and then now so the, you know if you're letting them qualify for the elite series like that, you think they're just going to instantly quit that when they get to my level? Right. No. Or or they're gonna or you're setting them up for failure because now that's how they know how to fish. They're not prepared for how it's really gonna be when you get on the elites because it's different. Once you get to the elites, you can't do that no more. But they're probably still gonna do it. There's websites that sell tips and waypoints and stuff now. Well, so. they got they got a rule on ours about that. That's elite on the elite series. You can, we cannot buy or barter for information. I remember those websites are out there. Fish so, tips. Um, did you guys ask Sean's? Yeah, question? that's what we just okay, asked. Okay, that's what I was going to yeah. say. I'm like, that's a good question. So I remember fishing on Kentucky Lake for a, I think it was 2019 for the, uh, the FLW Open, uh, the college series, and there was a, a there was like two or three. I don't remember the school, and if I did, I probably wouldn't say it. But there was like two or three college boats that were following a guide wrap with a, a boat wrap, Denali rods, you know, all this, that, and the other Bassmaster open badge. And he wasn't, these guys weren't even fishing. They were just following him and he, he was fishing and he was talking to him. Hey, this waypoint, these are the coordinates. This is what you're going to do here. And this was a day before the tournament. And I'm like, dude, like I'm out here trying to figure out Kentucky Lake. I ain't caught a fish in two days. And these guys are following a guide, a Kentucky Lake fishing guide. I'm like, damn, am I doing this wrong? You just didn't like, have enough money. Yeah, you got to have more money, man. But, well, <laughs> sure, don't we all? But it, hey, it, it, it goes on at every level. I'm going to tell you the saddest, what I, what I think is going on. I think it's, one of, I think it's awesome that it's, that it's happening. I think high school fishing is incredible. I think it's getting kids an opportunity to get on the water. It is very But cool. I got a real problem with what's going on in high school fishing. It's not about them kids going out there and learning how to fish or what their dads to teach them how to fish. But you think that you think that the pros are getting information? You ain't never seen nothing from what's <laughs> going down in these high school fish. And it's literally about who's got the biggest checkbook is what kids are doing well in these tournaments. Yeah. I mean, it's I'm getting the phone calls for it. I'm I'm getting asked for information. I know. And it that shouldn't be. I mean, if you want to, if you're gonna 
fish. Take them out there and let them fish. Let's find right. out who can really fish, not not who mom and daddy can pay for to get the information for. Right. Agreed. I remember, so when the college series came to the Upper Bay, I actually got like two or three direct messages on Facebook from guys fishing in, in the college series. They're like, hey, man, you're a local, blah, blah, blah. I'm trying to go fish. And I'm like, hey, thanks for the text. I'm fishing against you. Good luck. <laughs> like, like, you know what I mean? It was it was crazy. It is it is, it is is wrong. It's wrong. Uh, dude, like... I. Like that really, it didn't sour me up when I realized that that was what was going on. Like there, there's a college, um, and everybody knows it, but it's not against the rules. At least it wasn't an FLW. I don't know since they went to MLF if it's different, but their coach, they had a their their college coach or faculty sponsor or whatever would pay a guide to get waypoints, and he would just give them out to the guys, give them out to the team, and but say, "Here, go to this spot out, and throw it doesn't this." Doesn't even there's matter. High, 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 high school now. outside of high school doesn't. It, be it, whatever it doesn't matter right well they that was do the same exact but thing. that even that was the college series i mean and i mean and i fished the northern division these guys if they didn't win every tournament they had two or three boats in the top five every single tournament so, every single tournament somebody makes a hat now it's really good it says uh find your own fish that's all the hat says on it <laughs> find your own fish <laughs> here, here, here's just the truth of the problem okay there's no way around Anytime you compete for prizes or money, it's no different than racing or anything else. People are going to push the envelope to get an advantage. That is inherent in competition. Yeah. Now, there's no stopping it. I, I beat myself up over it. How do you police it? How do you enforce it? And honestly, it comes back down to the character of the animal. And... I've always said that you do the best you can to enforce it, to police it, and it ain't no different in golf. You, you watch professional golf, and it, it's it's straight up by the, it's character. I mean, it's respect for the game, it's respect for the sport, and as long as everybody's that way, then that's what it would be. But you got guys that are going to push that envelope, and I don't know how you enforce it. Other than, if, God forbid, if you ever catch one of them, I say you make an example out of it, and then you bury it. Right. That's that's all I've ever said. Yep. I mean, they caught some. Agreed. And, and if you catch him, you make an example out of him, and I promise you, you won't have to get but one or two. Right. And you'll have everybody's und full undivided attention. Right. Our but, sport pushes things under the rug. But just sit there. To, to, well, here, here's the problem why. Let's just say you catch a well-named pro and you think that he's cheap. And... First thing you do is you're going to disqualify him, right? Well, that's how that guy makes a living. And let's just say he didn't do it. It's so the first thing he's going to do is he's going to lawyer up on him. Right. Right. And then you got you a big old public PR nightmare. And unfortunately, here's the big rub. All these terminal organizations are sponsored by most of the same sponsors that sponsor the anchors. So if you go after him, now you're going to make a PR nightmare for a company that's spending all kind of money with you. So, you're, you're caught between the rock and the hard place. What do you really do? Right. I mean, without without video proof somebody's done something, it ain't no good to worry about. Because, I mean, just go fish. Yeah. It's, it's, it's literally, and I don't think, honestly, I fish against these guys day in, day out. I really don't think that they're, they're doing it. I mean, I've seen, the biggest thing that tips me off that, that, that something as long as I've been doing this, that something's up and something's fishy. Is when I get a first year guy that shows up, fish the Elite Series, and I've been to all these lakes, and I pretty much know after a number of years kind of how it fishes and where the good good areas are, where the bad areas aren't. And all of a sudden, you get a rookie shows up and he's on all the juice. Yep. The smells, boys. Yeah, 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 sir. Something fishy going on. Yes, yeah, sir. <laughs> <laughs> right. Somebody's a talking to somebody. Straight up. You guys might not know, but but Matt makes the uh, is it the how you say it? Tato, I want to say ta the pole. Yeah, the, yeah and glide baits. Oh, he makes glide baits. Oh, too. that's right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, here we go. Hold up. What kind of glide baits <laughs> you making, sir? That's the best that can be made. Go check them out. Tato Yeah, Tato. So Tato Designs .com? Yeah. 
D-A-D-D-O Designs.com. Okay. I, right on. I, I I'm a dude. I'm, I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a big swim bait fisherman personally. Uh six inch to six inch, seven eight, uh seven eighths. Six inch, seven inch, and uh eight inch is kind of what my confidence is right now. I'm looking to throw some nine and some ten inch glides possibly this we coming got, season. Got a seven, a nine, uh, and eleven. I uh so wh- while we're on the well, topic well, yeah before we get off of that what I was getting at originally was the tattle the I own three different Yolos and they all broke and I don't know if you guys seen the pool that he makes but it's so I was watching Scott Martin one day I believe it was Scott Martin and I was like man that pole that he's got looks I keep breaking hey, Yolo up, poles and uh, he actually mentioned it one day I looked into it and he was like yeah Matt Harris makes makes these I got to get me one they look they're like way better. In the YOLO truck. So before we get completely on the swim bait thing, so we we were just talking about with well, the information and right stuff. Swim baits, young, I'm swim baits swim is bait. like right. my passion, bro. Do you want to get a beer? <laughs> do you do you remember that that and it was a big thing for a while in the opens. It was like early summer where that guy, I think it was Ufala, was saying, "My name is so and so, and I own this lake or whatever." Like, and then we never really got an answer for that. Like somebody said that, oh, it was somebody's buddy that was trying to run people off of spots like what was your opinion on that whole thing oh. if you remember what i'm talking about i know what you're talking about. i think everybody that stayed in that house should have been disqualified for the year so i, mean, I and that's ex- I, I agree I with you 100 percent. i don't i don't agree with them disqualifying him for a day because it wasn't just the day it was the whole term right and i think that everybody was staying in that house they were staying with that guy Right. I don't want to say no names, but every one of those young anglers that were in that house that was going on. Right. You don't stay in a house with that guy and him go out there and do it that you don't know what's going on. Right. And so every one of those anglers. So you think so you think, so you think he was running people off of the spot, essentially? Oh yeah. I I think that he told those kids where those spots were. I think that that was very deep involved. I don't think it was handled the right way. That's my opinion. But I, but I think if it would have been me handling it with the video evidence that I had, every angler that was in that house, there was three of them staying in that house. Yep. You would have been disqualified from the opens for that year. Yeah. That that you would not come back. That video irritated me so much because so like I know you fish the Potomac in the Bay and like in the in the Potomac in the Bay you you've seen them the flotillas of boats out on the grass. There's 20 30 boats in an area and for the most part everybody's respectful. Yeah. But every now and then you get one one swinging Richard that owns the place and they want to run people off and like that video just reminded me of some experiences I've had on the Potomac and on the Bay where people were like, "Well, you know, I was here Wednesday and I didn't see it. Well, sorry, I have a job, dude. It's Saturday and I got here first. I don't know what to tell you. Um, but I actually, I agree with you completely. I think that was a very poor handling of that situation because it was clear. Like once the, once it all came out, like it was clear that this guy was running people off of spots and not only did they not disqualify for more than the day, they didn't say anything. They said, Oh, Hey, we disqualified it for the day. It's over with, and we're like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa hold on a minute. There's more to this, you know." Oh, then God, nobody. This went on for weeks, dude. Yeah. This was this filled my feed on Facebook for weeks yeah. to the point where I was sick of it. Well, the deal was this: if you went back and done any investigation, and you'd look at social media feeds, there were a couple of those owners that had put videos up there that they were staying at that guy's house using a pontoon boat that were sinking those brush piles that he was running everybody off of. Wow. That's this crazy. Was, this was a planned, well-thought-out deal, and then there was other people found those brush piles, and in order to keep those guys off of them, the gentleman that owned the house was down there running guys off. And there's no way that those anglers that were fishing those brush piles did not know he was going to do that. Right. I have heard that this fellow was actually known before this whole instance. Well, happened. he he oh. gave a fake name in the video and everything. He's a real fake. He, he he claimed he was Bobby Paxton. Bobby Paxton. Bat Paget. Bobby Paget is one of the best known anglers. I think it was Bobby. He said he was. Uh, one one of the the local studs down there. You follow it wins all kinds of terms. He threw out that guy's name. Wow. That's crazy. You don't think you, you don't you don't think that there was a conversation had 
at night while we were eating dinner that the guys were trying that I got a bad boat number. He'll probably get there before I do in the morning. And old, and old boy at their house saying, no, nah, I'll make sure he don't get on there. I'll run him off before he get there. Mm. That's kind of how that went down. You know it. I know it. it was yeah. Oh, yeah. Day. Yeah, we all know it. And, and it. and it should have been handled the right way. And that would have set an example throughout the Oaklands if you don't do this. Right. Um, yeah, that was a crazy – that whole scenario was just insane. And, like, I just remember watching it, and I was like – like, because when I watched it, I was like, there ain't no way that some local guy is running people off of a spot during the opens. Like, nobody's that big of an asshole. I'm sorry. Oh, he like, was that big of an asshole, though, apparently. Well, oh, yeah. He threatened to sue people. Absolutely. I wish he would have done it to me because I'd have probably got DQ because I'd have whipped his ass. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. We, we, we know That's about fantastic. your... Uh, we, Bass Fishing Hall of Fame. Got to get his boat and stomp the mud hole in his ass. We 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 seen the Randall Tharp uh, <laughs> one time when it looked like oh, he was no. about to do that. <laughs> Say that again. I'm sorry. We we lost you for a second. We still laugh about it. I That's mean, awesome. Situation that was two guys that were trying to win a tournament. We've been right. in those same situations. Against oh, the yeah. oh my goodness! Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I wish you could be here for some of the Thursday night. But, but you brother. could see on that video that that Matt was ready to whoop some ass. <laughs> it was just one um, look. You got to stand your ground sometimes, you know. Yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah. Ha- absolutely. Denny Brower, yeah. was, Denny Brower is known for for doing that. Uh, he was standing uh, there. That thing. So is mean, Ish, like, from what I hear. And that cat pulled up on me like that. Oh, we 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 would have went. We'd have went round. I promise. <laughs> my, I'd, have my, drove over his, I'd have run over his boat. I mean, I. <laughs> <laughs> my my favorite saying still is it. It's in the box. <laughs> that that skeeter's the the skeeter is the only right. hole in the game that's gonna handle it too, right? right? He's in the box. Hell He's yeah. in the box. <laughs> that was classic. Classic. Walk up to Bassmaster Classic Church shows and go. He's in the box. <laughs> so b- before we keep going, Matt, uh, again we super appreciate you coming on. How are we doing on your time? I, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I know you're a busy man. I want to circle back something. Tell you of something. He was talking about the camera poles. I got to get a shameless plug in. I no. got a video going to be coming pretty soon. You know, everybody, you see these guys get online and they're talking about, I don't know why everybody's running the camera, right? Why is everybody, you don't need no bass. Well, I'm fixing to release a video. This happened three years ago. When we first put the poles out, I had a, I had a customer that was fishing in FLW tournaments at Sam Raver. And it was a, it was a, the tackle warehouse tour or whatever it is. It was back before the split, so it would have been an FLW. In blast off, he got run over, T-boned, by another competitor's boat. Mm-hmm. The, the other competitor was running the Yolo Cup. And he was 60 boats behind this guy. He told, he told, Texas Parks and Wildlife that he was going 30 miles an hour, but yet he was he went out 60. It was really cold, and he went out 60 boats behind this guy that had my pole in his boat. When you see this video, it's going it's going to send chills down your spine. Had it not been for this video, it would have cost this customer of mine probably a million dollars because this guy told Texas Parks and Wildlife that he hit him. He, uh, but you see this gentleman is cold. He's got gloves on. He's got a helmet on. You see the sun. You see the horizon. He's just toodling down the lake. You can see the speed on his GPS. He told me, he said, it was cold. I was running 55 miles an hour. And out of nowhere, in the blink of an eye, he gets harpooned right in front of the console. God, God damn. Hit his boat. He goes out. They were both ejected in 50 degree water. Can you bring up? So I'm telling you, put a pole. camera in your boat. Tato. For your own, everybody that goes out on the weekend. I think we need to put up the. Uh, the you know, we all see the Karen incidents Tato. or whatever. Put it in your boat, man. Just put it in your boat. In this so happy world, that's the reason why when Bass decided we had to run cameras. I had done lost a couple fooling around trying to do social media content because either suction cups on windshields or 
whatever, okay. break out of light bases. And I'm like, well, I got to run a camera pole. I'm going to run something that's going to stay in there. Well, these, these mounts that we're making, we make them for the all different kinds. Every one of them, I promise you, they will stay in your boat. So God forbid something happens to mm -hmm. some yeah. idiot. You got you got video right there. Yeah. Hold on, we're trying we're trying to bring them up right now, uh, and share share an image of them. But look at that. That ain't no YOLO. No, tell me, just trust no, me. I, my no. YOLO I got now is riveted. I had to rivet it back together. <laughs> That's <laughs> like, serious. Yeah. That's awesome, man. It looks really good. Yeah, wow. it, is. it looks Dude. really solid. Yeah. Can you share that? Or they? I got the. We got some that go under gimbal mounts. We got one that's called a custom. But every bit of that is solid three quarter. It's the bar and the box is all three quarter inch aluminum, solid machine, anodized, powder coated. You're not gonna break it. And the price isn't that bad. The price isn't that bad, but just as much as a YOLO and way better quality. We just posted yeah. that link in the comments right below if you guys want to go check that out. It's less, so it's less than the YOLO. See that? It's even less than the YOLO. I, I hate YOLO. I broke so many of them. I hate them. <laughs> hey, look here. It's all made out of it in, in the United States. It ain't none China. There you go. Made in the USA. Yep. Yeah. Hold on. I think they're they're working on uh, sharing it. Uh, is my brother on the? Oh, by the way, Chad, my wife said you you ain't, you ain't sharing on YouTube, but I'll repost it on YouTube later. Uh, We're I, just on Facebook. I, I, I attempted to, oh, and it wasn't glide. working out. See the glide baits on that, that website? Yeah, that's what we're look. We're getting ready to look at it right I now. I had to like it was like pulling teeth not to get him to click on the glide baits and show the pole. He's like, glide <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. Yeah, I was. I was that, that's my son's deal. The glides. I was over there sanding primer on glide baits this afternoon for. I did eighty five of. Them. I told him. I said, I'm the cheapest labor you ever had in your life for. <laughs> You before fishing, if I'm correct, you were a mechanic. Is that correct? I, I worked in a body shop. My dad. Yeah, body shop. Uh, body yeah. shop. Mm -hmm. yeah. Man, hey, I'm gonna have to call you up because I got this. This I'm I'm redoing this bullet, and I gotta repaint the top cap. <laughs> and it's like, dude, in my head, I'm like, oh my god, this thing's gonna look like shit. Because it's a total DIY. I've never actually restored or flipped a bass boat, but this is my first one. And it's like, it's fast as shit when I take it out. But right now it looks awful. Like it looks so bad because the guy I had it before painted the top cap. And I'm like, man, this is like, you can't bring it back with the wet sand and the regel coat. It's, I'm just not going to put that much money into it. Dude, but are you trying to flip it or are you planning on keeping it and then selling your Ranger? I haven't decided yet. <laughs> it's curious. <laughs> it's, I haven't curious. decided yet. Of, you can go with a solid color and just basically sand it all down and prep it and you know, the spray it solid gel, or but they got some, they got some paints now that are that are like that are as hard as gel coat that'll hold up that aren't gel coat, a lot easier to work with. There you go. Very you cool. Paint, just as good as gel coat. Let us know. Can you guys still? Uh, can you guys still hear us? We are on uh, Tado.com. Yep. Tado Designs. We are on TadoDesigns.com. We are screen sharing TadoDesigns.com. I just want to make sure that we can hear uh, so we can go through the shop right here. We have several really cool designs. The seven inch glide. Oh, I like look, that dude, swim I see bait that head seven too. inch glide right away. I like that. See, it's a really, really nice shad profile. It's something that I think lacks sometimes in. I think sometimes some of the profiles are over. Well, let me, let me tell you the cool thing about that bait. You can throw that bait on a conventional flipping stick. It's it only weighs two and a quarter ounces. A seven inch fly. It yeah, and you, you you can you can slow chop it like a spoon. You can you can slow sink it. You mm. can you can literally get in on the banks of the of the Gunpowder River and go down the bank with it. It looks that is really all purpose fly bait that, that walks like you have never seen. Is that a hand paint? Yeah, I was going to say who paints yes, them. Every bit of, yeah. that is a hand pour. Every every bit of it. That's not wow. a wrap. That's a hand paint. That's a hand paint. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's nice. That's sweet. Okay. Yeah, that's nice. He's got to do an LY. We got a lot kind of, of What kind of? Do you know what kind of hooks he's got on it? Yes, sir. They're on or STXs. Okay, he's got. Sir, go. I will be putting in an order probably tomorrow on one of these glides. Well, it's kind yeah. of funny. We uh, we we. He just shipped out an order. I, I, I'll drop a name because it's kind of funny. They won't, I guess, because they know Josh is my son. 
none of these these big time pros, you know, they they, they won't say nothing to me about it. But I'm mad up here at the well, Douglas just got a big order of me and, and there was out of that whole entire order there was three customers I actually got a bait and the rest of them went to Elite Series guys or MLF guys. There you go. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, there. that is. Are, insane. Are, you, are you are you are you are you throwing big glides, Matt? Oh my goodness! It's a, hey, dude, I, I keep this glide that that seven inch glide. It's actually like six and three quarters. Uh, it's perfect size. It is. I, it's bite sized. It's bite sized. It's bite sized. It's, I don't have to have. I don't have to have a glide bait rod. I, I throw it on twenty pound floral. Yeah, and it's just a tool. And the cool thing about it is, it's the sink rate. You can throw it in the middle of a lay down, and it'll float. Long enough, you can sit there and walk it. Yes. You don't get hung up. You can, you can, you, you throw it around docks, and, and, and it's just, it's just a. When you come up to a piece of cover or a point or something, you know one's at. You pick it up, you throw it, you know, and and and, and you kind of search that area, and then you go about your. It's it's yeah. just a weapon that I, I keep on the front deck all the time. Hey, not to uh, not to cut you off, we want to give a big shout out to uh, one of our big followers, Sean Johnson. Uh, he he's he's uh, one of the owners of uh, Maryland Maryland Bass Fishing, and uh, oh. it's a big page. Love that page. Uh, um, he's always tuning in, giving in some good insight. Thanks for following us, brother. Tuning in, uh, and uh, dude, man, the swim baits, the glide baits. I'm definitely looking into them. The glide baits is uh, it's one of the things that I strive during our podcast. I always try to put some input in swim baits i love encouraging people to throw a swim bait if you don't have a six inch mag drift if you don't have some type of cheap glide bait uh, a lot of times i recommend i will take one a lot of times i recommend a uh, 168 s waiver something cheap for somebody to get started with um Just it's to not get a custom too yeah, from bait fishing because like yeah. yeah, it's not something that you use maybe all the time, but it's something that you need to learn when you, uh, when do you apply that technique to your fishing, uh, and you, you must under you must know how to use those baits and or have setups to use the baits because I think it's important. So Matt, do you fish a lot of glide baits on tidal water, like rivers? Like, do you find that? I haven't got to come to any glide, any, any titles yet with it, where there's a, you know quality fish. Right. I mean, the only the only tidal we fished in recent years we went to the Sabine River, and there ain't nothing down there bigger than the glide bait. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 He had a bait bigger than the fish. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, you know, if I could get to come to the Potomac or to the Chesapeake or whatever, I guarantee you, I'd catch them. Yeah. So why do you think that is with some of these fisheries where like like Sabine River is a huge fishery? Why all the fish are small? I mean, we have a lot of fisheries in our area that are similar, like um, uh, not in our direct area, but like I fished a lake in Virginia called Clater Lake where all the fish are like a pound. You just can't catch them any bigger. Why do you think that is? Well, the biggest difference between Chesapeake and the Potomac it's a lot further inland off the coast. You're you're a lot further away. From the tidal water, and you like if you go down toward the coast at, at Chesapeake, uh, down to Susquehanna toward the Potomac, you start getting into those tidal rivers down there, and the fish start getting small. Right. And the reason is you got a lot more saltwater intrusion, and right. they just don't live as long, mm. so they don't ever get to really be big. And that's that's a typical tidal fishery unless it's way up inland, where you got it can kind of get away from that push of salt water. They just don't get as big. You know, yeah. the Sabine River, I mean, we're right there on the coast. There, there's literally a mile from the, the intercoastal waterway, which is pure salt. There's a saltwater barrier there that, that you got to go through to get back into these places. And, I mean, it's it, – it, but still, it's not like a, a, a complete dam. It's just a barrier to slow the flow. So, it just – and those are my – what I call native greenies. They're just little marsh babies. Right. It's a true native marsh bass that does not get that big. And the, and the fish that you see caught at the Sabine River, those are fish that Texas Parks and Wildlife or somebody has put in there that's got Florida strain genetics. So that that's that's typical tidal fish. Yeah. You gotta you gotta get like a way Mobile, the Mobile Tensile Delta, you know, you got Mobile Bay and then all the rivers are coming from Alabama that flow away from it. You catch some real good fish, but you gotta get 
15, 20 miles away from that salt water. Pool. So that that's kind of seems to be the, the, the kicker there. Yeah, the Potomac has produced some some good good sized fish. And the Potomac has produced some giant bass. So double, double giants. digits. We, there's been double digits caught up around Susquehanna and the gunpowder. And, and there I still, has been. I still think that the the best tidal fishery in this area for big big bass, and you guys aren't going to like it, is the Chickahominy River. I don't know if you've ever fished it, Matt. You do? Yeah, I have. You know why? I would stop Florida. So, okay, so I'm glad you bring that up because we, like... High five. We totally, <laughs> like... So I applied to, to join the Maryland Black Bass Committee. I wasn't accepted. It is what it is. I'm not worried. I'm not upset about it. But one of the biggest things when I submitted my application was, hey, let's stock Florida strains in our eastern shore rivers. We have a lot of rivers on the eastern shore, like you mentioned earlier, you know, down towards the ocean almost. But in the headwaters... You have a lot of uh, you have a three to four foot current swing, uh, tonic water, cypress trees, lily pads, and things like that. But all the fish are like a pound, you know, two a three pounder on these rivers is like you're doing something, and they just refuse to stock F ones in there, and it, it blows. Do my we mind. have the ecosystem to support F ones? Yes, well, yes. Do you think so? Because I feel like Maryland's well, eco. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> the, the, the problem you have is is, is the short life expectancy. Right. You get a, you get a big flood tide, or you get a hurricane, or you get any kind of major push of saltwater intrusion up into those rivers, and you're gonna kill off a bunch of fish. Right. And and for whatever reason, that native strain of bass that's in those rivers, they are more saltwater tolerant. Florida can't stand it. Right. Uh, I, maybe a pure strain northern could. You'd have to talk to the biologist of which one's more saltwater tolerant. But you just, it, it's kind of like a vicious cycle. It's like we was talking about about the Middle River. The years that you've got really good grass, I mean, uh, they've done everything they could done to get those fish to come back from the kills. And it's basically, it's either been pollution runs in the back of it or it's been saltwater intrusion from major storms to kill those fish off. So it's just a vicious cycle, and that's just the inherent nature of saltwater fish. And it's you'll have it's cyclical. You'll go through a seven or eight year period where you won't have any storms, you won't have any saltwater big push of intrusion. Those fish will spawn. You'll have seven or eight years of spawn. They'll have really quality fishing, and then all of a sudden, boom, it's gone. Major fish kill. Right. I got it. And you start you start from square one. That's just title. That's just title. Got a couple people that we need to reply to. We got uh, Greg, who we talked about earlier when we talked about Mr. Scott. Greg and Mr. Scott are partners with the stocking of the rivers and all. Greg said that uh, the water's too cold for F1s, afraid it would affect their uh, their nat the native fish if they were uh, if, uh, interbred. Then we had uh, Dan, who's been a longtime fan of the show, as because uh, he's down in North Carolina, he asked about what do you think about Santee Cooper, or Lake Murray, or Lake Murray too. He can't say. Yeah. All of them right now are on the upswing. It uh, there was a time period there where South Carolina got onto a major weed eradication deal. They were killing hydrilla. They were killing everything. Well, there's some kind of grass that's got back in the south end of, of Murray. That they have tried to eradicate, but it's, so it's growing too deep. They ain't been able to, to kill it. Uh, they call it some kind of Illinois pond grass. I don't remember exactly what they call it, but the fishing has exploded. Murray used to have 20 foot deep LED in it, and it was really unbelievable fishing. And Santee Cooper has always been a tremendous fishery, but it's done got hydrilla back in it, and uh, it's just a bass fishing mecca. I mean, that. Both of them are phenomenal. If I had to recommend somebody, if you want to go on a good trip, if you can catch them when they move up to spawn and get around the cypress trees at uh, Santee, or if you can get on them, if you can get a trip planned to Murray when the when the bluebacks are spawning and them fish really get, it's, oh, God, it's, a, it's unbelievable. It's um, a lot of fun. Yeah, that, there was like a, uh, there was a tournament, I believe, uh, years ago at Santee that probably like one of the first uh, where someone got in the Century Club. If I remember correctly, caught like over. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. There was one of those down there. It was like a, I think it was uh, what was that guy's name? 
a Florida boy. Anyhow, he won that thing. That was a sight fish tournament. They hit it there. It was one of the weird springs where it had been really cold, and they got a, just a tremendous warming trend. And it's like every eight pounder in the lake swam to the bed. Uh, yeah, I think that's the same tournament. I'll, yeah, yeah, I've yeah. seen that. Yeah, well, yeah, and yep, it was, that was it, amazing. It, Aaron Martins was catching six pounders and giggling like a two year old. Right. <laughs> I mean, it was, yeah. Why is that? Preston Clark is who won that tournament. Yep, yep, yep. That's A who won it. Yep. Aaron Martins actually won in Middle River when the last time that we, the last time y'all were here, it was canceled, but the time before that, Aaron. Yeah, well, you know, because you placed very well, and your buddy Bill Lowen likes top five on that tournament. Yeah, it made me, it made me sick when Aaron won, and I thank the world, Aaron. But Bill was, was in a position. Bill had a, an incredible day up there, up there in the, in the creek, up on the, you know, by the climb. I think he was in Swan. Uh, yeah, you know, Swan Creek. Swan so. Creek, yep. yeah. Yeah, and you know, you know it's just not your time to win when somebody catches a seven-pounder and it comes off in his hand. Right. I mean, he caught it right there at the end of the day. Fish actually come on hook, and he still caught it. Yeah. If he don't catch the fish, Bill Lowen wins that tournament. You know the odds of catching a seven-pounder in Middle River now? Oh, it's, it's like <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Hey, what's up, Zachary? Thanks for joining us, brother. <laughs> it's not happening too often. Uh, but that, that's why Aaron Martins was who he was, too. Yeah. He, uh, he, man, so he was unique. Probably the most naturally gifted fisherman that we've ever seen in this sport. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we well. Uh, I think Bill Lowen did he switch? Did he fish Swan or did he fish Elk? He fished Swan. It was, he, it was definitely yeah. yeah Swan, Swan Creek as shallow as uh, you could get. And, and on, yeah. yeah, on the last day, the tide was like the water was like really low. He was like yeah. turning up mud with his trolling motor getting yep. through there. If I remember so correctly. Just a little Indiana, a little uh, Indiana or Ohio River spinnerbait. He, he flipped. Uh, I won't say flipping a. Uh, Berkeley, a little Berkeley fire hog. Yep. Bill had a win, what was it, two years ago? It, was, yeah, it wasn't that long ago. Yeah, he won at Pickwick. Yeah, yep. yeah, not not long ago. I remember that tournament. I heard he's like the nicest guy in the world. He is. That's what, that's what they say. I've heard that. It's like Bill Owen is give you the shirt off his back. Mm. Yeah, unless, unless it's me, you won't give me nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to be like that. Right. <laughs> that's what well, hey, so, uh, Matt, we're coming up on our time here. It's 948. You've been with us from for almost two hours, man. We we can't thank you enough for for everything and, and joining it's us, been, man. It's been it's a been great conversation. Over and above what we could ever ask for, to be honest with you. We even had you before we even went live. So no, they, they just can't been, know about the conversation my, my, before. That was oh, no, that, none of that. Yeah, that was that was good talk. But, uh, no, uh, we just – face of sonar if you say i did you're lying right. <laughs> right we appreciate you coming on us so much and uh we would absolutely love to have you come back on sometime if you're open to it and if you're ever in the area and you want to jump into thursday night i call dibs you're fishing with me matt i'm telling you hey, we're gonna hey, go out there and win it okay matt you got my you got my number text me if you're coming to town don't, don't worry about them shoot me a text dude i got you hold up wait we're going tin boat fishing wait dude. are we you like is this like some type of, my john boat is way more upgraded okay is that what we're doing dude i have a bullet all right oh here we go with the bullet <laughs> we're getting to the spot first like Ain't got forward face of sonar on their boat. Oh, that's not me. I ain't got it. I ain't Shit, got it. That's those two. <laughs> oh, man. I got a Death Finder. I got a Hummingbird uh, Helix uh, Mega, but I don't. I cut it on to check my water temp. And uh, that's, that's pretty it. much it. I don't even map because dude, I we, know the river so good. We really do. We fish it. the GP so much that. <laughs> I just want to know what the We use it for is. water temperature and depth, and other than that, it, nothing matters. Uh, we, well, we know exactly what we need to go fish. It's right. just. Right. Do the conditions well, I'm fishing it my allow whole life. us to do what we want to do? I've right. been fishing it my whole life. So Except like. for me. I'm throwing a nine-inch glide bait all the time, so whatever. If you get a bite, you're winning. <laughs> exactly. He, get, he got a bite once last year. And it, it counted, too. <laughs> it was Lunker. It was Lunker. It, counted for got Lunker once it was Lunker in the biggest <laughs> tournament of the year, and that's what mattered. <laughs> yeah. right. I've seen yeah. you out there that the, the yeah, day dude, I last. called. I called that thing on a uh, KGB Chad spread. Uh, Chad spread. Chad. Chad Chad. <laughs> Chad, right. Chad. <laughs> That's why it's called Bass and Beer. Right. Chad spread. My favorite 
favorite favorite places to eat in the world up there too. By the way, what's, what's that? that? Woody's. Woody's. Where is Woody's? Is that like more northern I'm sure Pennsylvania? Right up off the head of the Northeast River, right there in Maryland. Oh, oh, oh dude, I've heard okay, of yeah, 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 okay, yeah. okay, yep, okay, yeah, yep. right on. I'll give I'll give him a shameless plug. Just go in there and get you a steam pot. It's like Dungeness crab and last. Oh yeah, crab yeah, 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 yeah. All kind of crabs. Just oh my god. <laughs> still, the steam pot. It's, it's like a crawfish boil. boil, boil. Have you had when you were here? Did, when I get to Toledo Bend, I will probably gain about twenty pounds eating crawfish tails. Yeah, right. I love crawfish. I keep inviting them guys over. I do. I do boils all the time. That everybody's around here is like another because we're big on like steamed crabs and steamed shrimp yep. and crab cakes and everything all day. I do crawfish boils all the time. Like these guys got to come over. I was like, if you want to uh, think like a bass, you got to eat like a bass. That's all. <laughs> gotta go pull some tails, man. Yeah, you gotta pull some tails. Thank hey, you. uh. Matt, we Matt, we appreciate you coming on tonight, brother. Thank you so much. We want to cut you loose and let you get back to your life. And uh, man, I, I hope that you, I hope that you're willing to come back on our podcast again and or our live stream and and talk again. We thank you so much for coming on here and talking. Hey, thanks again, buddy. Hey, Matt, man, thank you. Appreciate it. All right, All right have a good night. See you guys. Let's see. I'm going to go back to the main Ooh. camera here. Oh, go to oh, Skype. Okay. Yep, we are good to go. Leave that. Man, Dude, no, that was right. great, man. That was, that was awesome. awesome. To told you, Matt, was a man. I, I warned you guys that it was going to be good. The juice we got before the interview. Can't say nothing. Damn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that was amazing, man. Yeah, I can, can, can't say nothing about that. I, uh, I hope you guys, we still have 12 followers here. Let me see. I got to get the. My wife followers. said you never shared it on YouTube, so she wasn't able to. I watch tried. It. I tried watching it on YouTube. It For some reason, there was something going on, and uh, I don't want to do too much clicking or too much. Right. Uh, yeah, that was, Paul, that was awesome, dude. Yeah, you know I see what? Paul, Paul jump to be honest with you, yeah. I, I got to say. Paul, you joined in late, and that's totally fine. But he's fishing. dude, this guy hung out with us for about two hours tonight. Oh yeah, yeah. I didn't like, ask him. Openly talked to us for about two hours tonight. Probably longer if you count the pre-show. Yeah. So and it's he literally, <laughs> we had him on for probably ten to fifteen minutes to like get everything straight before we even went live, and there was so much talk before. For that even off happened. the record talk. like off the record like it was even it was insane enjoyed it so much he was great cannot wait to have him back and uh very grateful uh for what just happened yeah that was maybe awesome maybe just enjoyed it we had I'll, david I'll fritz a, last week we matt hair this week we may even have another straight <laughs> angler in the next week or so Next week, oh, we plan on having one every week, dude. Every week, brother. No, that's the plan. But hey, listen, uh, we need to get those guys some thank you gifts sent out to them. Straight up. Yeah, I'll get their addresses and, and we'll send them out some thank you gifts. Yeah, Miles says shout out to Rob, and it is, dude. Shout out to uh, Riverboat Rob, man. A KBD uh, will be in town tomorrow. He's going to give a seminar at Susquehanna Fish and Tackle at twelve o'clock tomorrow. It's twelve thirty, around that time. But uh, shout out to you, dude. Ah, thank you, man. Uh, it's all you've good. been, shout you've out been to going you. through a lot of shit. You come through. You, you make some like stuff it. happen for us. Twenty twenty four is just like on fire. Just hey, hey, hey! What can I Let's say? Let's go. Uh, no, I mean I think the, the the guests that we have on the show really enjoy being on the show. I do too. I uh, yeah. I think David Fritz enjoyed it. Uh, David Fritz stayed longer than we asked him to. Thank, thank you, Paul. Uh, Miles said uh, twelve thirty tomorrow's KVD seminar. Susquehanna Fish and Tackle. It's only about what I don't know hour drive. Uh, Dude, I might go up there honestly. I was going to duck hunt in the morning, but I'm not going because it's going to be shitty ass weather, and I'm yeah. like, I ain't sitting out there and getting and, destroyed. And, and the shows are like out in a tent. You know, and, and so like with KVD, it's going to be, you're just going to wait in a long, very long line to get to say like five words to them and take a picture with them if you're lucky. And then, you know what I mean? I, I think, I don't know for sure. I mean, his seminar will probably be good. Uh, I went to a couple of uh, their seminars, uh, Greg De Palma. I went to a couple of Greg De Palma's seminars up there. It was really good, actually. And, and Greg was like a really cool dude. Hey, what the fuck? 
And he really did tell me that uh, if he had to pick between forward facing, you don't and get 360, it. It's so pick a three sixty. What's that? Something? It's so army, army. It's so out of regulation. It like irks me. Oh, it irks. It irks my core. I can't stand it. Anyway, sorry. I'm a nerd. What that shit. I want a. I want a fishing rod up Thanks, there. Thanks, Wes. Appreciate it, brother. Me and Evan go up to uh, Bass Fest one year, and they got this raffle. And then like Evan was like, "Dude, I don't want to like." I can't give up the juice, but he was like, do this with your card, you'll win. <laughs> like, that's all I can tell you. You're right. Card. So, I fucking won a Abba Garcia, uh, uh, Jordan Lee, Abba Garcia, uh, Abu Garcia um, rod. Catch a snakehead on it, like, the first time I ever use it. And I, like, I like lay it, like, where the top of the rod's on the console. And I'm trying to get the snakehead off, and he flops and snaps it right in half, dude. Ah! So, so, I won it, and then it broke it the first time I used it. So, it's like, I can't win. <laughs> Yeah. Man, I am just... Win a ride, break a ride. Win a ride, break a ride. I got to <laughs> say, uh, we're coming to the end of our show, and while we have people yes, here, man... I got to get home. The weather's I'm, getting I'm, funky I'm outside. I'm really, too, really dude. thankful, man. We got uh, Taylor Lures, taylorlures.com, Taylor Lures on Facebook, Message Warren, um, UMA Lure Company, uh, Tyler Hawthorne, Message Tyler Hawthorne. Hit him up on the website, umalurecompany.com, or hit him up on Facebook and Bass Munitions. Bass Munitions with uh, Mr. I am brain farting on his name. We're Larry good. Payne. Larry Payne. Mr. Larry Payne. Check him out on Facebook. Go to Bass Munitions Plastics. Check out Bass Munitions Plastics. We're thankful to have them on board with us. We had a great time tonight. Thank Matt Herring for, for coming out here with us. Matt Herring for coming out and hanging out. Drop some serious juice. A really, really good Did talk. Did not know. Um, he was and, not with Reaction Innovations no more. I wish I would have talked to him. You know what? But here's the thing that's cool Did about that. that. We might have been the first live online he broadcast he that he yet. announced yeah, that he's not with Reaction not with Innovations no anymore. So he's not with Reactions Innovations anymore. And that's cool. But uh, yeah, we, what's what's to come for Mr. Matt? We got to thank everybody who everybody's thanking us and awesome show. And we really appreciate it. If you guys want to uh, share Share the replay, spread the love, of course. Always appreciate it. Uh, I just want to, uh, we do we do appreciate you guys all the time. And, all the time, and, every Friday, and thanks, brother. Uh, you want to have to thank us because it's, you guys make the show happen because yeah. nobody watched it. it Dude, matter, if anyway. we, uh, straight up, if we didn't have... If we didn't have the followers that we have, the people that watch, tune in, we give us comments, we wouldn't. There is times where we have more comments and we have more engagement in our videos than some of the bigger podcasts on Facebook. And I see I, it personally. I think we've I, had 200, we've had 300 comments on this podcast where some of the bigger ones have had 150 to 100 before. We have great engagement. I appreciate you guys more than anything. Hitting that like and that share button, getting the word out and spreading out the friends and us bringing on more important people to bring more engagement is super important. We appreciate you guys engaging in they're, what they're, we are they're doing. They're part of the show. Like we consider like all our lawyer uh, listeners that are here every year. Right. These guys are part of the show, man. 100%. We try to ask all your questions that we can. And we got to say, what's up to Paul? He's down in Lake Anna. With uh, Kevin, Kevin Lake and Paul's Anna. down there. Paul uh, and Kevin's Kevin down Lake Anna. And Jason. Jason's so, down there, too. So you're Seabass, Ray Ramon. Mr. Snails he, might be down there as well. I got a new... Uh, Snails oh, Wheeler. Kevin, Kevin doesn't have a nickname. So I'll just say uh, Skeeter. His new nickname is Skeeter. I'm calling oh, him Skeeter. Skeet, Skeet. <laughs> skeet, Skeet. Something Skeeter. <laughs> skeet, Skeet. <laughs> skeet, Skeet, Kevin. <laughs> Oh, oh, Paul's oh, got him watching old there. Old Kevin Skeet Skeet. Oh, Kevin Skeet Skeet. Skeet, Skeet, Skeet Kevin. I like it better like that. Like, oh, Kevin Skeet Skeet. High <laughs> uh, five. I got to get, crazy, I gotta get my, uh, I gotta get my, myself on the road, man. That weather's yeah. getting funky out there. That rain started. That wind started. Right, uh, right, right, right. All right, y'all. Good one, though. Absolutely. We're, we're out for the night. Thank you guys for joining in. Matt Heron on. That was awesome. Let's go next week. Oh. Peace out. Oh, almost messed up. What's up, Frank? Jason, Snails, everybody down there with Paul. Hey, peace what's out. up, Frank? Good luck, fellas. I'm holding the pose. We have to do the peace out. Oh, is it peace or is it? Hold on, watch this. Uh, ready? Oh. Bro. Bye. Nice.